All right, I think we're live. Are we live? Oh wait, Mike. I um. Give me a second here. Okay. Uh, we didn't go to medical school for this. Dwayne Jackson says greetings. Greetings, Dwayne. Welcome. How's the tech? We're still we're still learning. We're total noobs. Yeah, we we both skipped this class uh, in medical school on um, audiovisuals. All right. All right. Thanks, Linda. Linda, how do I sound? Can you hear me? Okay, they can hear us both good. All right, great. I think we got the audio problems. All right, let me hop on. Um, everyone on um, Dr. Hansen's channel, um, I, on my community wall, um, if you go into my YouTube channel, um, I've posted uh, a couple of um, sort of instructional videos so that you guys can follow when I'm talking. I'm going to be going over some of these viral um, medications. I've been get, we've been getting a lot of questions on that. And rather than me just yapping and you guys just getting all confused, I made a bunch of diagrams. So if you guys go through uh, my uh, YouTube channel, like everyone on, my, on Dr. Hansen's channel, just uh, check it out. You can download it or you can follow along with Dr. Dr. Hansen's channel. Um, and everyone on my channel, just make sure that you've gone through my uh, community to get all those downloads that I just posted. Okay, so should we get started, Mike? Yeah, let's go ahead and roll. Okay, so uh, I'm sure you guys know who we are, but we're just gonna take a quick uh, couple of seconds and introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Dr. Brahm Yogendra. Um, I'm a board certified anesthesiologist. I am a physician. Uh, but before I get started, I just wanna say I've got my own concoction um, and my own treatment to cure COVID-19. And here it is. It's a um, polar spring water seltzer. I would also add some um, cinnamon. And um, I recommend this McCormick taco um, seasoning mix. Uh, I treated about uh, 20 of my friends who I think have COVID but I'm not really sure, but I'm gonna post a video on this on YouTube so it goes viral and uh, I'm sure it works. Um, no guys, I'm, I'm totally kidding about that. Um, my point is there's a lot, and, and I know Dr. Hansen's gonna talk about this in a second. Um, there's a lot of um, um, medications and treatments people are swearing by. They're telling people that, um, this is curing all their patients and whatnot. And it might be the case that we're not poo-pooing that, but we're just trying to come in with um, like an evidence-based medicine. And the thing is, you're gonna, one of the questions that, or one of the responses you're gonna get from us uh, is, uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the responses you're gonna get from us, we don't know. We have some studies we're not sure about. And it's not because um, we're trying to confuse you guys or whatnot, we just don't have that information. If we don't have it, we don't have it. We're not going to make it up so that we give you an answer that you want to hear and makes you feel good. Um, so I'm a board certified anesthesiologist. I am in currently in private practice. I have a background in public health. I have a master's in public health. I work for the Florida Health Department, and I was an infection control practitioner. Uh, I've known Dr. Hansen for over 17 years. He was my medical school roommate. So I'm just going to turn it over to him and let him sort of talk a little bit about himself. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am board certified in internal medicine. After my internal medicine training, I went on to further specialize in pulmonary, which is the lungs, and then also critical care medicine. So I ended up becoming board certified in all three of those specialties. And like uh, Dr. Yo said, we met in med school, actually slightly before med school, and we were roommates uh, first semester, and that's how we first uh, became friends that long ago. And so we kind of both came on this uh, convergent path, if you will, of making 
educational videos on YouTube. Uh, a lot of the reason for that, for both of us, is because there's just so much misinformation out there. It, it really upsets me sometimes when I see all this misinformation. And some of it is not even just from people who uh, are don't have medical backgrounds. It's some, some of the people who do have medical backgrounds. And a lot of them are trying to sell the snake oil to pocket, you know, put money in their own pockets. And it just, it really upsets me when I see misinformation, especially from people who know better. So that's really the big reason why we're here and also why we're doing this live session. Also, because during this pandemic, people really need reliable health information. It's all the more important right now. So that's a, a big part of the reason why we're doing this. So I'm glad that you're here. And uh, now that we got that out of the way, let's roll with some of the questions that you guys have been asking. Yeah, I think, uh, and as I mentioned earlier um, in my community post, I think our format's going to be, we're going to try to get all the questions that were asked to us on Instagram uh, and YouTube. Um, and then we're going to have a open forum. So any questions we were not able to get to or something that comes, something that you guys think of, uh, you can throw it our way. Uh, we may not have all the answers, but uh, we'll try to, if, if, and if we don't have it, we'll try to research it and, and get it to you guys in the next day or so. And one more point is, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of us don't have the answers because COVID is so new. So what, what answers we do have, you know, we base this on the most recent studies. We base it on also expertise based on previous studies with the first SARS virus and how these, you know, uh, drugs have worked before with different diseases and so forth. So everything is based on either science, you know, evidence-based medicine, scientific studies, and or opinion based on expert opinion, not just you know, someone read it somewhere on the internet kind of opinion. So, okay, so uh, I'm going to kick it off with the first question I have that's COVID related. So Varun Varma asks, can you talk about the testing situation as from experience? There are a significant number of false negatives with the PCR tests. Would you put more weight on PCR findings or those seen on CAT scan findings. If clinically and radiolog radiologically fits with COVID-19, but the PCR test is negative, do you still manage it as COVID-19? All right, so this is a kind of a complicated situation because with these tests, uh, roughly 40% of these PCR tests come back negative when in fact the patient really is positive. That's what we call a false negative. And Another way that they were diagnosing COVID in China was based on CAT scan, but there's since been studies that looked at the accuracy of making the diagnosis for COVID based on the CAT scan, and it's not very accurate. The sensitivity is not as good as the PCR, so the sensitivity is even worse, um, and the specificity is not good either. So. Basically, the CAT scan is not a good way to make the diagnosis. It can give you clues as to the diagnosis, but it's not good enough to make the diagnosis. Essentially, there's two ways, maybe three, three ways to make the diagnosis. One is by what we all know is where you do the PCR. And then part of the key to actually getting a good result for that is you have to do the test right where you do the swab and you put it all the way up the nose. And it's very uncomfortable for the patient. So it has to be done by a nurse who knows how to do it. And that's why doing the tests at home, if that comes out, is not the best idea because most people don't want to inflict pain on themselves in order to get that test. The other thing is, another way that's coming is the serum antibody test. The problem with that is there's different manufacturers and they all have different sensitivities and specificities, meaning they all have different accuracies. So we don't know, again, if that's going to come back, if it's coming back negative, is that a false negative? A lot to learn about that as of this point in time. And then the third way that I was mentioning is when someone does a bronchoscopy. So uh, let's say uh, I bring someone to the endoscopy suite in the hospital and I do a little camera with a tube and I put that and in down into the lungs and I take a look. I can squirt some, squirt some fluid down into the lungs and then suck it back up and then test send that test off to the PCR to test for COVID. But no one is really doing that because no one wants to expose all the healthcare staff to that patient who might have COVID. And it's a lot of effort. And so 
there's other you know PPE that you have to burn through. So most people, it's very rare that they're using bronchoscopy to make the diagnosis. So where does that leave us in terms of testing? Right now, we're still stuck using the PCR based on the nasal and oral swabs. And pretty soon is going to be the serum antibody test. But a lot remains to be known in terms of what is the sensitivity and specificity of the test, meaning what is the accuracy of the test. So um, Stacy, oh, sorry, Mike. Are you, are you, oh, yeah, I'm done? done. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and guys, if you have any questions uh, related to it before we jump on to another um, another topic, but if, if there's something that pertains to what we just uh, talked about, you can ask it. Um, but try not to ask any other questions right now because it'll just throw us off a little bit. Um, so we're just trying to get through these questions as, as quickly as possible. Okay, so uh, Stacy G31 um, from YouTube uh, just asked a question, can the virus be passed in sperm? So uh, that's actually a pretty good question. Um, the quick answer is no. Um, so there was a study. Did in you know that some some people that was some some women can have allergic reactions and anaphylaxis from sperm? That's actually true. It's very very rare. That's it's, it's very rare, but it is actually true. Anyway, could carry on. I, I I will I will try not to make an inappropriate joke. We'll, we're going to be professional here, but maybe maybe after our session, Mike. Um, but there are no positive, um, the RT-PCR results were found in semen or testicular biopsy specimens. Uh, so they determined from this Chinese study, there is no evidence at this point of sexual transmission um, of COVID-19. But um, maybe in the last day or two, there's been a new study in India um, where uh, they found ACE2 receptors were highly expressed uh, in testicular cells um, at the protein level. And what was interesting, they found that the ACE2, um, there was very little to almost no expression on ovarian tissue. Now, this team in India, um, they're suggesting that the high expression of ACE2 in the testes um, raises the possibility that, um, or this might be the reason why we're seeing more males um, developing, um, not only developing COVID-19, but also some of the severity with the, with the infection. Um, Mike, I think, um, someone just asked a question on my end about maybe if we want to take this, how long does it take to develop antibodies to test for? All right. So when we have a viral infection or a bacterial infection, essentially any infection, what happens is our immune system develops antibodies to that. And the, the types of antibodies that it forms in response to that infection, IgG antibody and IgM antibody. The IgM antibody takes about a week to develop in response. And then the IgG takes a little bit longer than that. It's a, typically a couple weeks, a few weeks. So when we first get the infection, you have to realize it takes one week for the IgM and then longer for the IgG. So that has implications in terms of testing. So if someone has an infection and they go to get tested, that means they, you can't really do the serum antibody test right away. At least if you do re do it right away, there's a good chance that test comes back negative because you didn't allow enough time for those antibodies to develop. I know there's this big thing. Uh, so this next question, Linda Cotton on YouTube. Dimox in high altitude sickness. Please watch this lady on YouTube, Ava Green, she says. What if she is right? All right, so uh, this honestly could be a whole video by itself talking about high altitude pulmonary edema and Dimox and how high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE for short has similarities to some patients with COVID-19 ARDS. And so in that video, she's making the leap that Dimox can somehow be effective for COVID-19 ARDS. So first of all, I'm going to clarify, but clarify that there's no specific proven treatment for COVID-19 ARDS. The reason why there's this comparison by some people of high altitude pulmonary edema to certain forms of ARDS that some COVID-19 patients get 
is based on the fact that there are similarities with the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary hypertension that can occur. So there's a very famous Italian researcher by the name of Doc, Dr. Gattinoni, who's published so many articles uh, since the 1980s about ARDS. And he noticed, this just came out the other day, he noticed that these some of these patients with ARDS from COVID-19, they have similar findings to high altitude pulmonary edema. Not all the COVID-19 ARDS patients, only some of them. Typically with ARDS, you have, it's acute, so it develops over hours to days. There's very low oxygen levels. There's bilateral infiltrates on the chest x-ray or the CAT scan. And it's non-cardiogenic, meaning it's not due to left-sided heart failure. It's due to pulmonary edema, not because of the heart, in other words. And when you look at the CAT scan or when you look at the chest x-ray, there's tons of inflammation within the lungs. It's like all white on the x-ray in the lungs. Now, what he noticed is that some of these patients with ARDS, they have very low oxygen levels. That's not attributed to the degree or the proportion of inflammation that they see on the CAT scan within the lungs. So the reasoning is that, well, because there's not as much inflammation as we expect for their degree of low oxygen levels, they're saying that this is likely due to another process. What I think is going on is there's pulmonary vasoconstriction, meaning the pulmonary arteries that go to the lungs, that deliver blood to the lungs, so that blood can go and pick up oxygen from the lungs. What's happening is the, those arteries are constricting, not allowing as much blood to get there. And when that happens, that can cause very low oxygen levels. So there's essentially two types of ARDS that's going on with COVID-19. There's the typical ARDS where we see tons of inflammation in the lungs. And then there's this other kind of ARDS where, yeah, there's inflammation in the lungs, but not as much as they expect, given the degree of hypoxemia, the degree of low oxygen. So that's why people are comparing it to HAPE, high altitude pulmonary edema, because in HAPE, they also have the fluid buildup in the lungs, but they also have a lot of vasoconstriction pulmonary hypertension within the lungs. And that's why they get so hypoxemic, meaning low oxygen levels. So that's why people are making the connection. They're saying, well, COVID-19 ARDS has similarities to HAPE. Now, HAPE is, I don't want to say treated because it's uh, prophylactic medicine, but Dymox or Cetazolamide is used as a prophylactic medication to prevent people from getting HAPE when they climb mountains. That's what high altitude pulmonary edema is. So actually, Dymox isn't used to treat HAPE unless you give it very early. It's actually more to prevent HAPE from happening. So people are coming to the conclusion, which is a wrong con conclusion, by the way, but people are coming to the conclusion that, well, therefore, Dymox should work for COVID-19 ARDS, and that is simply not going to happen. You have to understand how COVID-19 ARDS, how that pathophysiology works, and you also have to understand how Dymox works. So Dymox, which is acetazolamide, it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. In other words, it inhibits the enzyme, uh, and as a result of inhibiting the enzyme, bicarb, so bicarbonate, HCO3, that gets dumped into the urine and you pee out that bicarb. And what that does is it, is it temporarily uh, makes the, the bloodstream more acidic and you actually, it stimulates the brain centers. Okay, you got brain centers back here. I'm sorry, the breathing centers that are located within your brain. It's in the pons and the medulla. And this triggers the pons and medulla to tell the lungs to breathe faster and harder. And when you do that, you temporarily, although very little, you temporarily slightly increase your oxygen levels. So what I'm trying to say is Dymox will not do anything for COVID-19 ARDS. It might temporarily slightly raise your oxygen levels, but that's about it. So this whole theory about Dymox or acetazolamide for COVID-19 ARDS, it's not going to happen. Mike, I, I just got a question yeah. on my end. Um, the question is, are blood clots part of the low oxygen? 
Yeah, so it can be. Uh, with ARDS, there's three. There's actually three reasons why the oxygen levels are so low with ARDS. And this is before COVID-19 came out, by the way. This is what we already know. Part of that low oxygen is because of so much inflammation within the lungs. And the alveoli within your lungs are not only filled with fluid and, and, and inflammation, but a lot of the alveoli actually collapse. So that's number one. Number two is the pulmonary vasoconstriction that I was mentioning, where the pulmonary arteries constrict and they send less blood to the lungs, and therefore they pick up less oxygen. That's the second way, or the second reason why there's such low oxygen levels. And then the third reason is, with ARDS, there's actually lots of platelets are involved in the initiation of that process, and those platelets, with all the chemokines and uh, the cytokine storm, that actually leads to what we call microthrombi, which means very, very, very tiny clots in the capillaries, the smallest blood vessels in the body. The capillaries in the lungs can be filled with microthrombi, these tiny clots. And those tiny clots can form into bigger clots. So people can actually get clotting with ARDS from all that inflammation. And so that's three different reasons why the oxygen levels become so low with ARDS. Okay. Okay. So the next question, um, so th the next questions are sort of going to be, um, it's going to take, um, I'm going to bunch up a bunch of different questions and Mike, uh, you know, jump in and, you know, cause it's probably going to be, uh, a, a this is, this is the lecture part of, this is a, a lecture part of the segment. Before I get started, Mike, uh, I got, there's a question. Um, can the DIC test diagnose it? Um, I'm wondering if you mean the, uh, like a, uh, like a DIC picture. Is, is that what you're, you're referring to when you're doing, um, the, um, when you have sepsis, the DIC, the disseminated intravascular? You're asking me? No, no, no. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Lali Lezava. Because she said, can the DIC test diagnose it? So I'm wondering if she's referring to DIC and tests to, let me see if she writes. Yes. So I think she's, she's referring to DIC. Mike, so, can you hear me? Yeah, so with DIC... Okay. Some, sometimes patients with ARDS can get DIC, which stands for Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation. And this is a, when this happens, there can actually be both bleeding and clotting going on pretty much at the same time. Sometimes it's, uh, you get one before the other, but uh, the, with, you know, with DIC and with ARDS, yeah, they both can happen. Although it's not very often that you get DIC with ARDS, but it's certainly possible. Uh, with these patients who have COVID-19 with severe ARDS, based on all the studies that we're seeing, we're not seeing DIC, at least not in a, a majority of them. Maybe a few patients here and there, but DIC is not really common in, in uh, COVID-19 ARDS. Great. All right. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Um, all right. So we got a lot of questions. Um, we got a lot of questions about um, viruses and virology and the medications that are being being tested. And um, what I've decided to do is um, kind of go through some of the kind of combine a whole bunch of questions together. Um, one of the questions we got was from Fly Network 8 on Instagram. She had a question. Her mom is on uh, Tenofovir. Tenof and she wanted to know our opinion on it. Um, Journey of the Dawn Treater had a question of the different types of strains um, and what strains are being tested for. If you had a mild strain, would that help or harm if you get a severe strain? And if you get a severe strain without having mild strain, could that be causing more deaths? Um, 
Katrina Draper on YouTube asked uh, what causes a, vir a virus to mutate and how is mutation proof? So I'm just, uh, and then one more person had a question about, I'm going to try to tie this all in. Um, his name was Kyle Herndon. He said, there's a reckless nurse viral video that claims this virus is not a virus at all, but 5G. Um, her argument is that HIV virus dies in sunlight and cannot be transferred by saliva. Can you go over the different types of viruses and how each group inhibits different ways of transmissibility? Can HIV be caught by saliva? There's a lot of people that are listening to uneducated professionals who are claiming this pandemic is not a virus at all. So I'll just, uh, I don't want to address the conspiracy theories, and I think Dr. Hansen probably agrees, uh, but I will say that the 5G, I, I get a lot of questions on that, and there is absolutely no science to back that up. Um, now, what I'm going to do is um, kind of go over the viruses, a little background into it, so that way you guys can understand when we start talking about the medications and the antivirals, how it fits into the whole picture. So um, if you haven't gone uh, yet and gotten the, the sort of diagrams I've made, again, they're on my community page, on my um, YouTube channel, and you should be able to follow I posted all of them there. There are four uh, different diagrams. So diagram one, it looks like this, and it'll say coronavirus and spike protein and ACE2 receptor. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview on how the coronavirus gets infected. Um, you know, as Dr. Hansen has talked about in a lot of his videos and including mine, um, the ACE2 receptor and the type 2 pneumocyte, and that's the um, those are the specialized cells in the alveoli that are responsible for making surfactant. And surfactant lowers the surface tension um, for the um, where the alveoli and the and the blood vessels meet. Um, so how this works is you see that if you get a little, let me see if I get this a little bit closer. The lighting is. I mean, again, if you you can download this uh, and see this for yourself on my community page, if that's the virus. Coronavirus is an, has an RNA strand. Now, what that means is viruses are either an RNA or a DNA. It's just a genetic material. Um, and there's a, a question of, is a virus even uh, live? Is it an organism? Because it's just a strand of, of DNA. And now, the spike protein, um, it's basically, the name corona comes from a crown-like. So it's got these spikes around. And what we found is that it has an affinity for the ACE2 receptor, which a lot of times are expressed in all over the body, but mostly in the in the type 2 pneumocytes. And what happens is the RNA, when it gets into the ACE2 receptor, it'll release the, um, there's a couple of different mechanisms. Again, this is not an immunology course, so I'm just going to gloss over uh, some, um, some details so that we get to the major point. The RNA from the virus, what it does is it, I'm just trying to get my finger, let me just hold it up like that. The RNA will then um, make a, what's called a RDRP, that's an RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Let me see, hopefully you guys can see that. It's also known as a replicase. And what the replicase does is then it goes and it codes that RNA to make more RNA. And it also makes viral proteins, and then all of these go out and infect other cells. And they, they infect the cell and cause it to burst and you know have the inflammatory response and inflammation and the cytokines and all of that, and th that whole cascade. So what is the point of this? Well, this enzyme here is the key. This enzyme that the RNA from the virus, it codes itself, to make more of the virus. Now think about it, your virus is hijacking your cell's machinery. And what it does is then this enzyme is the key to where all these medications are taking place. So if you look at diagram two that I posted on my community page, you're gonna see this picture. And this is actually the enzyme itself. And these are all the different medications that, are that their researchers are looking at. 
And one of the things that people are talking about a lot recently is this drug tenofovir, which is an HIV medication, um, and it's also used for hepatitis B. And it's actually part of Truvada, um, one of the two HIV medications, which is targeting the replicase enzyme. The other one of interest is remdesivir, which has been a lot in the news lately. So that mechanism of action is to inhibit this enzyme, thus it's preventing the RNA from replicating and you're preventing RNA replication. Now I wanna go back to diagram number one and I wanna point out one more point here. We hear this, this uh, we get a lot of questions um, and we hear this thing about the zinc and zinc as potentially uh, inhibiting viral replication. We are not sure if it does for COVID-19. There are some suggestions. There are some previous coronavirus, rhinoviruses, which have shown that zinc inhibits viral replication, and it does by inhibiting that enzyme. And there is that whole concept of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine being an ionophore and allowing that zinc, because it's a zinc is a, um, a plus two molecule uh, compound to get in. So the mechanism of action for zinc also is to inhibit the viral enzyme here. Now, I'm going to go shift gears a little bit. Um, we got a couple of questions about HIV. Um, there was a French, and this is another question we got. Um, and I just uh, got, we got, just got this question today and it's from Tracy Pritchett from YouTube who wrote, please read this short article by Luc Montagne, uh, who won a Nobel, Nobel Prize in 2008 for identifying the HIV virus. He mentions there's an RNA in the HIV virus found in the coronavirus genome. He mentions at the end of the article, you could use interfering waves, to destroy the sequence. This is a viable method to kill the virus. So... The thing with, um, with viruses is they are, a, like I said, a genetic code. And what that means is it's just a strand of material. And there could be some overlap with other viruses. Um, there is someone else saying that uh, malaria has some sort of sequence, some genetic sequence like COVID-19. But that does not mean anything because a lot of these viruses might have, there might be some component that's the same, but it doesn't mean that this was genetically engineered in a lab or some conspiracy theory, um, until we see some evidence, it's just a theory and cons conspiracy theory. And there's really nothing right, nothing that's suggesting that this concept has any left. But I wanna talk, shift gears for a second, um, because I'm on this path on, on HIV. Um, and there's a point I wanna make about this because the research from HIV um, from the past couple of decades is actually steering a lot of the new medication and some of the experimental medications and research that's going on. So I'm just going to quickly touch upon um, HIV. And there's one particular medication that has a lot of promise. Now, if you go to, I believe it's diagram, uh, apologize, let me see which diagram, I, I messed my numbers up. Um, okay, file number four, file number four, you'll see HIV, and um, that's the T helper cell. So you can, you can follow with me at home. So HIV is also an RNA um, virus, and how it works is it's got these glycoproteins, the glycoprotein 120 um, on the virus, and it has a strong affinity to the CD4 on the T helper cell. Now, if you know anything about, if you remember any immunology, uh, I just did a video on cytokines uh, and vaccines where I talk a little bit about the T helper cell and its role uh, in the pathogenesis. But the T helper cell um, has a CD4 receptor and another um, cytokine, uh, sorry, a chemokine receptor called CCR5. And that's going to be really important for COVID-19, um, one of the medications. But I'll quickly just touch upon what's going on here. So HIV, the GP120 protein, binds to the CD4, also has an affinity to the CCR5. Once the virus is in, the HIV RNA uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So the difference between coronavirus and HIV is HIV uses 
a reverse transcriptase to make HIV DNA. So remember, the coronavirus just only made copies of its RNA. HIV makes a converts to a HIV DNA. Now, what's interesting is it's all done in the cytoplasm of the T helper cell. It gets into the nucleus and it integrates into your own DNA. And I sort of represented that with the purple and the blue. And that's how HIV is able to hide um, from, and, and it's, not un, it's not able to be detected uh, in the cell. But in the meantime, it is still making all of its, uh, um, it's making more DNA strands, it's making all of its viral particles and infecting other cells. Now, um, let me shift gears. So the CCR5, and this is file number three. And there's a lot of sort of information on here and I'll just quickly go. So what CCR5 stands for is chemokine receptor type five. And chemokines are basically cytokines that are secreted that direct cell movement. They're almost like, I mean, this is probably a really poor analogy, but almost like pheromones where you're sending a, a signal and you're attracting a cell. So if you look at the top of this diagram, I drew this little picture, drew this little picture over here, chemokine concentration, and you see where it said T cell. So as the, the chemokine concentration increases, the T cell is going more and more. It's attracted to it. And what is that attraction? It's the CCR5 receptor on the T cell. So the CCR5 is also found in macrophages. It's also found on breast cancer and prostate cancer. So it's actually being researched for these two cancers. So the chemokines, they bind to the CCR5 receptor and they draw that T cell or the macrophage into the area of inflammation or an infection or trauma. Uh, and in this case with, with COVID-19, all the inflammatory and, uh, and the destruction it is doing. So now the T cell comes in. Now as the T cell comes in, it secretes its own cytokines, calling more inflammatory mediators. And then they're all secreting more cytokines and you create the cytokine storm. So that's the, pretty much the pathogenesis of, or that's how CCR5 is being related to COVID-19. Now, why is that important for us? Well, there's a lot of novel medications that are coming into play here. And one of them is called, hopefully you guys can see that, my lighting is a little, but I, like I said, you guys should be able to follow this if you've downloaded it. Um, it's a medication called Laronlimab. And this is a monoclonal antibody that actually blocks uh, right, there we go. blocks the CCR5 receptor. So remember what I said was, it's the chemokines that are attracting this cell through this receptor. By blocking it, you're almost like holding someone's nose and, and closing their eyes so that they don't see where they're going. They're not attracted, maybe there's a smell, um, and you're sort of blocking that. And that's sort of the mechanism that is taking place. Um, and in HIV blocks the CCR5 uh, so that HIV GP proteins cannot bind to the CCR5. In COVID-19, it blocks it so that the chemokines can't um, sort of entice it or um, make it get attracted. Now, the other important thing I'll just mention about the CCR5, uh, more related to HIV, um, they've actually found a mutation. It's the Delta 32 mutation on chromosome 3, which is where the the, um, the CCR5 receptor is expressed. And they found that about 10% of people from European descendants uh, or ancestors um, have a mutation. And the homozygous group, which is about less than 1%, so homozygous meaning they have genes from both the, the mom and dad, um, for this mutation, uh, it actually has a protection or an immunity from HIV-1. Um, remember, there's two different types of HIV, HIV-1 and 2. So it makes them immune to HIV-1. Uh, and that's because this mutation doesn't allow the receptor to be expressed on the T helper cell. So then when HIV comes to bind, it's like, oh, there is no CCR5. I can't bind. So it doesn't infect that cell. Um, in fact, some of the research going into bone marrow uh, with some of these HIV patients that have responded or they say they've gotten cure is because they got... Uh, stem cells from patients that had uh, the mutation, the CCR5 mutation, which was kind of kind of interesting. Um, 
so I wanted to now that you guys we went over the viral question. Um, I'm going to just go over. Uh, there was a couple of questions about. So the question about tenofovir. So now you understand uh, Fly Network 09 on Instagram. Uh, tenofovir is going to block that replicates enzyme, and that's how it works. Now the journey of Don Trita, you asked this question about the strains, and this was actually a really, really good question. Um, so this is what I found. Um, there are eight different strains of coronavirus, and you can track this information on a website called nextstrain.org. That's N-E-X-T-S-T-R-A-I-N.org. And you can see how the virus is migrating and mutating. Uh, it's really fascinating. I mean, you can spend hours looking at this stuff. Um, <clears throat> now, the good thing about the COVID-19 is that it mutates very slowly and no one strain is deadlier than the other. COVID-19, uh, the genome has about 30,000 base pairs, uh, but and you got to compare that to the human genome, which has over 3 billion. Uh, mutations are uh, changes in the genetic and the viral genetic code. So what that means is, let me get back to my diagram where I had earlier. As this replicates is... Um, this enzyme is working on the on the viral RNA to make more. There could be errors and mistakes in the coding here, and that's how mutations are formed. Now, sometimes it could also be an evolutionary. There could be new medications that are coming into play, and the virus itself is um, changing uh, its sequence. But there can also be mistakes in how it's coded, and those mistakes create. Uh, mutations. And I'm going to talk about mutations in a, in a quick second. Now, uh, despite there being eight different strains, scientists have so far found only 11 base pair changes um, and, and out of the 30,000. And the current virus strains are still very similar to each other. And only one of those mutations actually uh, affects the spike protein, which, you know, we've been talking about, Dr. Hansen's been talking about for weeks, about how that's the part of the um, virus that's binding to the the um, the ACE2 receptors on the cell. So the differences in severity of COVID-19, as of right now, our understanding is that it's not due to uh, different strains infecting people, and it's not um, it. There aren't. We're not testing for all the different strains. Like I said, there are eight different ones, but it's so minor that it's just and and the, and COVID-19 right now is slowly mutating. So. And finally, my last uh, thing about viruses, like I said, I'm just trying to bunch it all together. So we're not talking, you know, uh, just trying to organize all of this. Trina Draper from YouTube asks this question, what causes a virus to mutate and how is mutation proved? So viruses are basically genetic code, like I mentioned earlier. They're an RNA or DNA. Then they're surrounded by a protein shell called a capsid. A coronavirus is actually what's called an envelope uh, virus because it's actually got an envelope around it. And think about the genetic code. It's, uh, it's an instructional manual for the production of uh, more RNA or the DNA, uh, more enzymes and protein, and basically for making the machinery. It's, it's almost like a cookbook that's telling the virus what it needs and how to make it uh, to make more viruses and, and spread. So once inside the cell, your viral genetic code goes to work to hijack your cell's machinery, makes copies of itself, and to move out. And as I mentioned earlier, the mutations happen when there's a change in virus genetic code, whether it's by mistake or the virus trying to adapt and evolve. So to, in order to detect mutations, and I think that's what Trina was trying to ask the question here, they're actually surveillance programs run by various governments, health organizations, academic centers that collect blood samples to identify parts of the viral genome that are susceptible to mutations and which parts stay the same. So when it comes to coronavirus, the uh, envelope viruses um, and the stable outside of the cells, I'm, I'm sorry, so when it comes to coronaviruses, they are envelope viruses and they are stable outside because of the spike protein. So the spike proteins actually is, um, it prevents them from having direct contact, so it's able to survive on surfaces longer. One of the questions someone asked earlier was about HIV uh, and how long it survives. So when I worked at the health department um, many years ago, one of the rules we had was, um, was how many seconds would 
um, would HIV live? And a lot of studies had shown that it just lives a couple of seconds outside of bodily fluids, whereas something like hepatitis B could live for 30 days, HIV would die out very quickly. And a lot of it has to do with the protein, what's the, the actual structure of uh, the virus. And in coronavirus, the, the, uh, the coronas, the, the spikes, actually protects it from or protects it from surfaces for a long time. And that's why soap is actually very uh, effective in getting rid of the virus. Because people ask about, what about um, um, you know, using disinfectants or alcohol-based? And that's great, but soap and water really can wash away the, the viruses. Another thing uh, uh, that a lot of people are, are asking about is Losartan. Uh, because a lot of people... All right, so here's the thing. A lot of people have hypertension in this country, right? And not only do a lot of people have hypertension, but it's shown that the people who are at very high risk of getting, or not necessarily getting, but people who are at very high risk of having worse disease from COVID is people who have high blood pressure. Now, a lot of people with high blood pressure are on certain medications, such as an ACE inhibitor, such as lisinopril, a lot of people are on medications such as angiotensin receptor blockers, such as losartan or candesartan or telmisartan. All these sartans, these are all angiotensin receptor blockers. All these things that end in opril, like uh, enalapril, uh, lisinopril, these are all ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, they both work similarly in different parts of the enzymatic reactions in the body, but they both affect the what we call the renin, the renin angiotensin axis. And this is actually thought to play a huge role in COVID-19 patients, especially with COVID-19 ARDS. Because if you saw my video that I did, my last video, you realize that when this uh, when this cell gets in the body here, it's gonna downregulate this ACE2 receptor. And when that happens, that affects this, this pathway here. And the end result is you're going to have less angiotensin 1-7 and more angiotensin 2 within the lungs. And this is bad. But we do know that the ARBs, like losartan, they're going to inhibit the angiotensin 2 from binding to this receptor. And that's a good thing. So we can't say that this is happening for sure in, in, pa in patients who have who are taking losartan or who are taking lisinopril, th these studies are actually ongoing. They're in clinical trials right now. And we're going to know soon if losartan is going to be beneficial for reducing the severity of COVID-19 ARDS. And we'll also know the same thing about lisinopril and the ACE inhibitors. So the, what people are asking is, should we continue to take our ACE inhibitor or should we continue to take our angiotensin receptor blockers such as losartan because there's also a theoretical downside to taking these medications. The answer is everyone continue to take the same medications that you're already on, especially because you want to have whatever medical conditions you have. You want them to be in under control. So that's one thing. There's a theoretical, this is not proven and I actually don't think this is very likely, but there's a theoretical concern that when you give the angiotensin receptor blocker, that it might um, downregulate the, uh, I'm sorry, upregulate the ACE2 receptor, which in theory means there's more amount of receptor to bind the virus, which in theory means you could actually have more viral infection. But the reason why I don't think that's very likely is because we know that the virus downregulates the ACE2 receptor once it gets inside that cell. And actually with the HIV virus, it actually does the same thing to the uh, CD4 cells, the T cells, when it binds to the CC4 receptor and the CC5 receptor on that T cell, the HIV, the HIV virus actually downregulates that virus to prevent more HIV virus from getting into that same cell. And we know that this is what the coronavirus, this, this novel coronavirus is doing. This has been proven with the first SARS coronavirus. So with this uh, downregulation of the virus, I don't think that's going to have any impact as far as low sartan having upregulation of the ACE2 receptor. So the recommendation as of right now is everyone continue taking their same medications, including for blood pressure. So take your lisinopril if you're supposed to be taking it, 
take your low sartan if you're supposed to be taking it. In my opinion, I think based on what we know for previous studies, I think this upcoming uh, clinical trial with low sartan with lisinopril, I think those results are going to have positive results. So again, we won't know for sure until we get these clinical trials, but I feel very good about that. If it were me, if it were if it were me who had, hopefully this doesn't happen, but hopefully this never happens. But if it were me who has uh, COVID, ARDS, I would definitely want to be on an angiotensin receptor blocker. That's I'll say that much, and I'll leave it. I'll leave that at that. Um, Mike, um, yeah. just to follow up on on what you said about the okay, so because I just got a question. Um, from Jay Pablo, he said, can we say if you take this drug, inhibiting ACE2 receptor could work, diminishing viral charge, but this could slow down the progress of infection, right? So I guess he, his question is, um, have an effect in diminishing the, the virus or slowing down the progression of the infection. With what... I, I didn't really understand the question. It's, uh, you take uh, ACE2 uh, um, a, um, ACE inhibitors. Yeah, so that's basically what I was just saying as far as uh, ACE inhibitors and these angiotensin receptor blockers. I feel like the angiotensin receptor blockers, based on the pathway that I've, that I've shown you guys with my diagrams in my previous video, I really think that especially with the low sartan angiotensin receptor blockers, I think these medications will have a huge impact in lessening the severity. They're not going to prevent the virus from infecting the cells, but I think they're going to have a big impact on reducing the severity of infection, meaning not as bad ARDS or maybe not even ARDS at all from this. Now, a lot of people are also asking about asthma. So with asthma, I have asthma myself, and uh, I, I certainly can relate. Uh, there's different severity uh, with asthma. There's there's intermittent asthma. There's I only get asthma when I uh, exercise. I only get asthma in the cold weather. I only get asthma when I exercise in the cold weather. Then there's the the persistent form of asthma where I always have it and I always deal with it, but it's relatively well controlled or maybe it's not well controlled. The thing with asthma is it's you have to realize 90% of asthma is due to allergies. It's really an allergic reaction within the lung and it causes the allergic reaction causes inflammation within the lung and it also causes bronchospasm meaning the bronchial tubes within the within the lungs they constrict and when they constrict that means the flow of air the air doesn't flow as as well as it does when those tubes are dilated so when we give someone albuterol what we're doing is we're temporarily dilating increasing the size of those bronchial tubes with that said, so asthma is a reversible disease. You can give medications to reverse it and you can avoid the allergen sometimes to uh, reverse it or prevent it from happening. The question is, do people with asthma, do they, are they at higher risk of getting COVID? And, are, and also if they do get COVID, are they at higher risk of having worse disease from it? The official answer is we don't know because there, are, there haven't been actual studies done on it. But most physicians would think, myself included, that having this inflammation within your airways would make you more prone to getting the virus and make you more prone to having worse disease if you did get it. So that's why just about all physicians that I know, including myself, would recommend, regardless, we'd recommend the same thing, but especially with COVID-19, would recommend having your asthma under control. So whatever that entails, whether that's you mean whether that means you need more uh, beta agonists, mean like salmeterol, more Advair, more inhaled steroid, uh, maybe a biological agent. You know, you'd have to check with your doctor or your pulmonologist to get your asthma under control. If that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do. And so, my patients who are most of my patients now are through telephone or through an app that's like FaceTime, because uh, we're trying to reduce the number of patients coming into the office to reduce spread. But when I speak to my patients on the phone or through this FaceTime-like app, that's the main concern is trying to get their asthma under control, as we always do, but especially now with COVID-19. So check with your doctor, uh, see what you can do to get it uh, under control, and that's the most important thing. 
if you have it under control, it's less that if you have it under control, that means you're less likely to have inflammation within the lungs, and therefore less inflammation makes it less likely that you'll have worse disease from COVID. Again, we don't have studies on this, so it's hard to say definitively, but most clinicians, based on what we know about asthma and infections in general that affect the lungs, this is typically how it plays out. So the bottom line is get the asthma under control. Mike, I got I got two questions for you. I think you'll probably be the best to answer this. So one is, um, initially people heard ACE inhibitors were bad and some switched to beta blockers. And the, the question is, is your stance on ACE inhibitors controversial? And the other question I have is, um, what about asthmatics taking steroids? Don't steroids help with viral infection? You want to give us your thoughts on that? So steroids, steroids are a funny thing because they reduce inflammation, but they, but because they reduce inflammation, sometimes infections can become worse because you don't have that immunity as a defense. So sometimes steroids work for some infections while they can also worsen certain infections. So with COVID-19, we don't know. The general recommendation is avoid steroids because they can make the infection worse, although that has not been proven yet. Um, the other thing someone was asking about, what was the other part of your question? Um, the, about, the ACE, about the ACE inhibitors. Yeah. Uh, is your stance on ACE inhibitors, is it controversial? So my stance on, this is my opinion. Uh, it, what's not, what is not controversial is that there have been studies uh, in animals that have proven exactly what I'm talking about. So that's, there's no controversy there. If there is going to be a controversy, is based on what happens with these ACE inhibitors and ARBs in humans because that has not been proven yet. It's not been proven in humans that given losartan or lisinopril will either worsen or improve your chances of getting COVID or worsen or improve the severity of COVID if you do get COVID. This is why... I'm so anxious and looking forward to the studies coming out in these clinical trials for Losartan. These clinical trials, the randomized clinical trials, that's how we know if there's an impact or not. That's basically the only way. However, I do feel very confident that Losartan especially, which also, by the way, is uh, a very similar drug to Herbisartan. They're both ARBs. So Telmisartan, Herbisartan, all those R-sartan, uh, slow sartan, all these medications are in that family of angiotensin receptor blockers. So that's my stance on that. It's not really controversial in terms of what I'm saying. It's just my opinion, how I feel about it. Someone might disagree with me, but based on the research that's been done in animals, I feel pretty good about it. We'll see what happens. And I guess there was another question regarding, I think the, it's also regarding the ACE inhibitors. Um, the question is, um, would you take it at stage two COVID? And I, and I believe uh, Journey of Dawn Treater is referring, which I think when she says stage two, she's more of the moderate, you know, it, instead of an early sort of a, a moderate severity of the disease. When would you consider, in your opinion, taking an ACE inhibitor? Well, the only way that I'd be able to get it is if I were involved in a clinical trial. So, again, I, you know, if I, if I went to a hospital and I had, you know, moderate disease of COVID, no one's going to give me Losartan because I don't take it already. Now, if someone comes to the hospital and they're already on Losartan, we'll give them Losartan. But if someone's not on it, we're not going to give it because it's not proven effective for COVID. The only time that would happen is if you are enrolled in a clinical trial. And that's the time that someone would get that for COVID. But until that happens, it's not going to, you know, no one's going to get Losartan otherwise. I, and I think you, you brought up an interesting point, Mike, about uh, things being in a clinical trial. And, and this is going to be my next video tomorrow on hydroxychloroquine and, and sort of how it, it, a lot of societies, uh, medical societies are coming out saying that uh, instead of just rolling out the mass public, it should be just limited in the context of clinical trials because we 
still don't know. There's nothing substantial. There's nothing concrete. Everything we know about medications like hydroxychloroquine, even Losartan, any of the medications we're talking about, uh, it's all uh, unsubstantiated. So um, I got a question here about um, smokers. I'll just quickly answer and how bad can it get? There's uh, definitely a uh, correlation between uh, smoking, vaping, smoking marijuana, and the severity of um, COVID-19. There's definitely um, evidence and reports about that. Um, the the follow-up question is how bad can it get? Well, any sort of underlying disease, especially respiratory-wise, uh, in my opinion, makes you more susceptible. You've got high, reactive airways when you vape and you smoke. Uh, and I, I, in my opinion, I think that increases your risk of developing pulmonary complications. What do you what do you what do you think, Mike? In terms of smoking, vaping. Yeah. Anytime you have inflammation within the lungs, that's going to make you more prone to the virus getting inside your cells because you have to realize that inflammation, that's your lungs have a, a built in way of defending against viruses. And although it's not always 100% effective, it's less effective if there's already inflammation going on in there because it breaks down your barriers, your defensive barriers. So whenever you have a breakdown in defensive barriers, it makes you more prone to getting foreign objects inside, like viruses, bacteria, and they have an easier way of causing infection. So inflammation, that's gonna be caused by allergies, especially if they're uncontrolled, asthma, especially if it's uncontrolled, uh, any kind of irritant that you get, you get down there, such as vaping, such as smoking cigarettes, such as smoking weed, all these things are gonna trigger some degree of inflammation uh, depending on how much you do and the severity of allergies you have, all these things play a role in that. But anytime you have allergies going on, asthma that's uncontrolled, you're putting irritants down there, vaping, smoking cigarettes, marijuana, you're going to cause irritation and therefore inflammation. And that inflammation is going to break down your barriers inside your lungs, making you more prone to viruses and bacteria. Yeah, you should probably just stick with gummies. So, no, I'm just oh, actually, you know, that. actually, this is a true story. I just had a patient last week in my in clinic, and she was hospitalized two months ago because she actually was smoking cigarettes and crack. It's a true story, and she actually got discharged from the hospital. She almost had to be intubated with a breathing tube and a ventilator, but she barely got by without it. She was sent home, and she lit up a cigarette. And her symptoms came right back. And so she actually stopped cigarettes. She, she stopped smoking cigarettes. She stopped vaping. And she, of course, stopped crack cocaine. And she's now uh, eating gummies to get her, um, you know, her THC. And she's fine. She's much better now. Her lungs are better. And she's good. So, I mean, and the, 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 the moral of the story is don't do crack, first of all. But also, it's better that you don't smoke. And, of course, vaping is also going to cause irritation in the lungs. So, gummies, seriously. Um, Mike, um, w one more question on the ACE. Um, there's FECE asked, have you seen patients already on ACE inhibitors who got uh, COVID-19? I think what he or she's asking is, um, can taking ACE inhibitors, people taking ACE inhibitors, let's say for hypertension, um, could they decrease the risk of COVID-19? It's possible. We just, we just don't have proof of that. The, the ACE inhibitors, the studies that I was talking about earlier that have proven, those are based on animal models where they specifically uh, alter the enzymes in, in, these, in these animal models, and then they prove that in the animals that this is what happens. And so there are studies in animals that have shown where if you alter that pathway, you end up getting less inflammation in the lungs. You end up getting less uh, fibrosis in the lungs. You get less pulmonary vasoconstriction, pulmonary hypertension. You get less of that in the lungs. So this has been proven with these medications in animals, but it hasn't been proven with humans. And so until we do that in humans and we put these people in these clinical trials with these drugs, one being a placebo, one being the drug, and then we see the results of those trials, that's when we know for sure. Until then, we can't say this is the case with humans. Coming soon, though. Coming soon.
you got me. Yes, I drink Red Bull. Not not the best for you. I'll give you that. Wait, are you, you're drinking a Red Bull? Right I, now? It was a sugar-free Red Bull, so I mean, yeah, I mean. Listen, Mike, what did I tell you earlier? I got the Doctor Yo concoction. <laughs> going to do this, my cinnamon and my my taco seasoning. Seriously, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to uh, patent this and sell it for nine ninety nine. PayPal, you can send nine ninety nine. That's a cure cure um, COVID nineteen. Anyways, let's uh, let's get moving. Um, what's our next question? All right, so yeah, I drink water. Yeah, water is good for you. All right, so what about aspirin? Could Germany's low death rate be due to excessive use of aspirin here? Uh, I don't know why the Germans have a low death rate. I don't know specifically what they are and aren't doing, so I really can't comment on that. In terms of aspirin, what it is, is it's, tip it's actually considered an NSAID, meaning a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. How that would affect COVID, I don't know that it would. But at the same time, there aren't any studies that have proven or disproven that it would or wouldn't work. So I really can't comment on that. I don't know. Someone asking about gin and tonic. Well, someone also asked about nebulized ethanol. Nebulized ethanol. Wow. Well, I would I would assume it would get you drunk, if that's what you're asking. But it's not going to do anything for COVID. Uh, okay. Oh, BCG. Did you talk about BCG? No, no, Mike. Um, you wanna, you want, yeah, you want me to tackle the, yeah, the BCG go, go, question? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, let me see where the question was. Uh, where is my BCG? They're just asking, like, BCG. Does it have any impact on uh, your chances of getting? Yeah, no, I, you know? I, I'm just trying to read the. Uh, there, there was actually a couple of questions on this. Let me just try to pull it up. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, okay, so what, oh, you, go part, ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Mike. What? I was just gonna say I was gonna talk about something else while you're looking for it, but if you got it, go ahead. Um. Yeah, okay, no, no, I just pulled it up. So the, the question was, uh, does BCG help with COVID-19? Um, so here's the thing. BCG um, is a vaccine used against tuberculosis, um, and how it was prepared is by an uh, attenuated or weakened uh, mycobacterium bovis. It's a bovine mycobacterium. So remember, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is what causes TB, and it's used primarily uh, in a lot of Asian, African countries, some European countries, in the United States, uh, it has never really been used. It's sort of been a mass campaign. So anyone that was grew up in Europe, in the Commonwealth countries, out in Asia, might have had a BCG vaccine. In fact, we were talking earlier about fake news and things on social media. There is this thing that's floating around on people's WhatsApp. Uh, one of my cousins uh, got this uh, text message where they said if you have the scar from a BCG vaccine, there is a 75% chance that, or a 75 decreased risk of coronavirus. That, again, fake news, false things being spread on social media. That is not the case. So right now, researchers in Australia and Netherlands, they're testing the idea that BCG, if you had the BCG vaccine, it has some sort of broad power to boost the immune system against COVID-19. But the WHO has actually just come out and said right now there's no evidence to suggest that um, a BCG vaccination uh, or even getting the BCG vaccination is preventative or it could uh, decrease any uh, risk of contracting COVID-19. So I think part of the reason why is where some of the low numbers of the COVID-19 outbreak have been have been in, in places where uh, there's a high prevalence of BCG vaccine. So I think people have started to make this correlation that, oh, why are these people having low rates of COVID-19 and saying, oh, look, there's it's because of the BCG vaccine. But there's really nothing right now to suggest that 
if you've had it, uh, you're going to be protected or you have some sort of immunity against it, or you should rush and go get the uh, BCG uh, vaccine. So and like I said, the children vaccinated in the low and middle income countries around the world, they've seen actually lower death rates from respiratory infections. So again, that's another thing people are looking at, coronavirus, respiratory infection, BCG protects against respiratory infection, let's investigate. And that's the common theme that um, you, uh, we're just gonna keep on hammering. It's where make, you can make correlations, we can make some hypotheses, but it, it's not an absolute truth. It's not, um, it's all uns unsubstantiated until we get randomized control, double-blinded studies that prove some of these things work. So as of right now, as of today, there is no correlation between, or no studies to suggest that there's a correlation between the BCG vaccine and COVID-19. All right, so someone, a lot of people are asking about beta blockers. So beta blockers, there's no reason to think that they would impact the virus in a negative or positive way in terms of either your chances of getting the virus or if you do get the virus, reduce the severity of illness. So when you look at the, the pathophysiology of the you know, COVID-19 and the way it causes ARDS, there's really no role of beta blockers either stimulating or blocking the beta-1 receptor or the beta-2 receptor. There's really no role uh, in the pathophysiology with that. So there's no reason to suspect that it will impact the virus and or the disease in any kind of way. And I'm not aware of any clinical trials that are involving beta blockers because scientists as well also don't feel that that would actually impact it in any kind of way. And another one was asking about, are the kidneys, are the kidneys affected? Is the brain affected? Is the heart affected? It's hard to tell uh, based on what we're seeing. We do see some patients who have uh, heart damage from illness. We do see patients who have kidney damage from illness. And in some cases, it can affect the brain. What we do know is we do have these ACE2 receptors that are in all those locations. They're in the heart. They're in the kidneys. They're in the brain. They're in the intestines. So is it possible that the virus is getting to these ACE2 receptors in these various organs? It sure is possible, but we don't know that yet. We have isolated the RNA, vi the, the uh, virus's RNA. We have isolated that from the blood, but that does not prove that the virus is actually intact inside the blood. But it is plausible and possible that this virus is intact in the blood and then it gets to the different parts of the body and it and attacks those ACE2 receptors in those different organs. What makes the, the picture cloudy is that sometimes just the effects of the cytokine storm can affect other organs as well. So that's why with influenza, for example, you see there's a, a patient who was left blind. She had what we call encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. And that's not because the actual influenza virus was getting there. It's because the effects of the immune system and the cytokines that are floating around in the blood and then they affect other parts of the body. So that's what makes the, the picture even cloudier, if you will. Now, the other thing that makes it cloudy, as I mentioned with cytokine storm and the effects of the immune system, lots of times with ARDS, that's what happens to the kidneys. That's what happens to the heart. So. We don't know at this point, is it the virus itself getting there and causing destruction, or is that destruction a result of the, the immune system attacking the various parts of the body, as what happens with other diseases, such as bacterial infections? We see that all the time. So is this kidney damage? Is this heart damage? Is this damage to the brain? Is this from the virus actually getting there, or is it from the inflammation that's actually uh, is based on the actual viral infection in the lungs. That we don't know, and that remains to be seen. And, and, and that's why I'll just follow up with what Dr. Hansen just said. Um, and that's just a great point uh, you brought up about uh, the cytokine storm. And I think cytokines are, um, the more uh, I dive into this and the more I start to research, uh, I find that w one of the things is, my whole theory is, if you watch some of my videos, it's, um, I feel like there are some, um, you know, the lungs and the respiratory system is the main pathology. 
but there's also underlying processes and ideologies taking place that are contributing to the pathogenesis uh, and the disease severity of COVID-19. And for the longest time, I was trying to figure out what that glue was um, to sort of connect the dots. And, and me personally, um, I, I, find, I feel that cytokines are, um, are, are that potential glue. That's where it's going to connect sort of the lungs with the kidneys, with the liver damage. So a, that's a great point you make, Mike, about, about the cytokines. Because I feel like we're just only scratching the tip of the iceberg with uh, we're just even understanding cytokines. There's hundreds of them. I'm getting emails about, what about this cytokine or this cytokine? Well, <laughs> you know, that's just, uh, you know, the, the, the major one right now is interleukin-6. Um, I, I believe interleukin-10 is playing, I'm sorry, interleukin-1 is also playing a role. Um, so there's a lot of investigation going into that. But um, yeah, I, I, like I said, I just wanted to just sort of reiterate what Mike was saying. I personally find, think that it's um, just from what I've read, I, obviously there's a lot more clinical studies that need to be done for us to definitively say it's this or that. But just when I look at everything, it's, oh, I, I just feel like cytokines are playing a much more major role than, yeah. than maybe initially was suspected. And I think you're right. And there's a lot of people asking, like Carl J asking about IL-6 receptor inhibitors, such as tocilizumab, such as cerilumab. So there are uh, results coming in for these uh, drugs that are showing it's making a positive impact in these patients. But just because you have some stories in some cases where there are positive results, you can't say definitively if it is making an impact or not. There are, they are in clinical trials as we speak. And so the hope is these uh, trials finish sooner rather than later and we get positive results from that. One of the downsides, even if they do work, they are expensive for one. And they do come with side effects as well. So even if they do work, it's not going to be the uh, the panacea, as they say, it's not going to be the great cure. It will, if if the results do show that it does work, it will have a big impact, though, overall on people with COVID. And and again, Mike, uh, just to follow up what you said, um, scalability of any drug and any vaccine is is the reality. Um, again, I just did a video on vaccines, and one of the things I talked about was there are financial, um, their political um, sort of factors that have to be taken into place, uh, into consideration when you're talking about these drugs. And also, you got to deal with local authorities, health authorities and regulations and markets and all of that. So um, we can't look at these decisions in a vacuum just because it works in a lab and these things are expensive and pharmaceuticals don't have the ability to scale these medications. Um, that is something we have to we have to take um, we have to take into consideration. The other thing um, I was going to mention about the um, um, the scalability was one of the attractive things about hydroxychloroquine, even though there was really very little evidence to suggest that uh, it was effective against uh, COVID nineteen, was the scalability. It was cheap. It was readily available. And I think that's part of the reason why um, I think there was very little information. And human nature is when there's very little information, they, we panic and we get very protective about ourselves and our families. And I think part of the reason why there was a sudden rush for hydroxychloroquine without data, which really goes against the grain of um, sort of our medical community and how things have been for the probably the past 50 years rushing this medication into the market was to quell the fear of the general public. Um, I'm actually putting a video out tomorrow on hydroxychloroquine and actually talking about uh, a story called, a bit of medication called thalidomide. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how those were very, uh, the tragic story about thalidomide and how it's impacted how we look at vaccines and drug productions and why the FDA is as sort of very stringent as it is and why it, it left a lasting impact on the medical and scientific community. So anyways, I just wanted to ch chime in on, on what you had just said, Mike. Yeah, and then some people, uh, Rodrigo was asking about nitric oxide either as preventative or treatment. So definitely would not have any role in preventative, but it does possibly have a role in the treatment of COVID-19 patients with ARDS. 
if you were here at the beginning, you remember me talking about the two types of ARDS that COVID-19 patients are getting. One of them is the one where we see all the inflammation within the lungs. And the other type is where there's not as much inflammation as we normally expect for someone who has such low oxygen levels. And these are the patients that are thought to most likely benefit from inhaled nitric oxide. When we talk about uh, inhaled nitric oxide, that's for patients with severe ARDS. And that there are actually studies done on patients with severe ARDS where we gave nitric oxide to patients. And those studies showed that it improves the oxygenation, but it didn't improve survival. So that's why we stopped giving nitric oxide to patients with severe ARDS. But with this atypical ARDS that's happening with some of these COVID-19 patients, if they have a lot of pulmonary vasoconstriction, meaning these pulmonary arteries are constricting and delivering less blood flow to the lungs, those are the patients who are thought to most likely benefit from inhaled nitric oxide or an IV epoprostenol, which is a, a drug that is a prostaglandin that has a similar effect where it dilates the pulmonary arteries. So this hasn't been proven yet, but it's worth at least trying in these patients if they are on the brink of death. If they're if they're uh, low oxygen levels are that low to the point where they're on the brink of death, it's absolutely worth trying inhaled nitric oxide or IV epoprostenol to try to improve the oxygenation to ultimately try to improve their survival. Absolutely. So Mike, and since we, we talked, a, since you mentioned a little bit about ARDS and, and cytokine storm, um, I've been getting some emails on this question, was how do you prevent ARDS, and how do you treat cytokine storm? Well, that's everything that we've been talking about in this conversation because still, we don't know who is likely to develop ARDS. We know that there's risk factors where some people have certain risk factors that make them more prone to having worse disease, but that's about as good as we can get it right now. We don't know who exactly, and we don't know why exactly, some people develop ARDS. We have reasons that we think pe some people are getting ARDS, maybe some not so, so much, but we don't know for sure. So that's all I can really say is we just don't know at this point. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and the same thing with, with the cytokine storm. There's very little, like, we understand, like, why are some people more susceptible to others? And one particular theory, uh, and this is a research that came out, I believe, in 2015 in Australia, um, where they, they looked at, so what happens is when you have a, a T cell that um, they, so what happens is if there's an antigen that finds an uh, antigen-presenting cell, so either a macrophage or a T cell, they find an antigen. It what it does is it it shows a piece of that. Uh, let's say it's a virus, for example. It'll show a piece of that viral protein on a sort of a receptor called MHC one, and the immune cell, the T help, helper cell, will come in and bind to that receptor and forms a complex. And that's how sort of I'm not again I'm not going to get into the whole immunology behind it, but there's a protein that is um, released called a perforin that punches holes into the that infected cell. So let's say a virus comes in, it infects a cell. Um, it, um, when, when it presents an antigen, basically it's telling the immune system, hey, I'm under attack. The immune system, a T cell comes, attaches to it, and releases, um, an end, uh, releases a protein called perforin, um, and that what the perforin does, it actually makes holes into the cell and allows an enzyme called granzyme to go in and, and lyse, the, um, um, lyse the infected cell. Well, what happens is there is a mutation, and I think it's roughly about 15 to 20 percent, that's what this Australian study was saying, that there's a, a, a mutation in the coding of the perforin protein. So now when the immune system comes in, and it's trying to sort of fight off the virus that's invading it, it can't, the perforin cannot make holes in it. And that kind of creates the cycle where cytokines are ramped up because it's, it's basically, 
Just think about someone trying to ram through a, a wall, a concrete wall, and they're getting angrier and angrier and angrier because they're trying to break that wall down, but they don't, let's say, have the necessary tools or the, the strength to break the wall down. And that's kind of like how some researchers think the pathogenesis behind cytokine storms is there is some defect in this perforin protein, so the, bio, so the T cells cannot attack it, and it gets more frustrated cranks up more cytokines, and as more cytokines come, it's calling more inflammatory mediators, and now you've got the storm, and it just goes out of control and starts attacking uh, healthy, normal healthy tissues, kidneys, livers, heart, whatnot, lungs. Yeah, and a lot and of people are one. asking about, about proning in ECMO, so I want to get to that. So yep. with, with proning, you have to realize proning shifts the body's mechanics and it shifts the body's physiology. So we know that proning works for patients who have moderate to severe ARDS. This is before COVID became a thing. We knew that proning will help with moderate to severe ARDS. The way that we define moderate to severe means a P to F ratio of less than 150. P meaning the amount of oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen in your blood divided by the percentage of oxygen that you inhale. So let's say right now I'm breathing 21% oxygen. That's the air that I breathe. That's what you're breathing right now. Now, if you divide the partial pressure of oxygen in your blood by that percentage of oxygen, that's going to become a certain ratio. And if that ratio is less than 150, these are the patients who have ARDS who will benefit from prone positioning. For those of you who don't know, proning is when you lie on your chest instead of your back. Now, when you are in the prone position, what happens is the weight of the heart is taken off the back of the lungs. When you lie on your back, that heart is sitting on top of the back part of your lungs and it compresses the back part of your lungs. The other thing when you're lying in the prone position is it actually makes it easier for the diaphragm to contract. Your diaphragm does 90% of the heavy lifting of breathing. So when you make it easier for the diaphragm to contract, you make it easier, you make the mechanics of breathing easier. The other thing too is lots of people have sleep apnea whether they know it or not. Not everyone has sleep apnea, but a lot of people have sleep apnea that they don't even know they have sleep apnea. And when that happens is people with sleep apnea, they have temporary obstruction of the airway and they actually stop breathing for a little while. That's what apnea means. And when this happens, the oxygen levels decrease. So when you are lying on your back, your most people's sleep apnea actually worsens just because of gravity. So when you are prone, and you're lying on your chest, all those three things that I just mentioned, you're improving those mechanics and you're improving the physiology. So you're able to get more oxygen from the air that you breathe into your blood. Now, someone else was asking about ECMO, which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's a fancy way of saying we take out blood from the body and then we take that blood and we put oxygen into it and remove the carbon dioxide, the CO2 from that blood and then we put that blood back into your body. But in order to do this, it requires putting huge catheters into your body, and it's a very risky thing to do. Uh, it requires patients to be on blood thinners because if you, they don't get the blood thinners, then they'll have clot develop within those catheters, within the tubing, and then that clot can travel back into the body and cause blockages everywhere. So lots of patients, about 30% of patients who have ECMO have serious bleeding as a result from that. Now they have looked at the uh, the ECMO results in patients with COVID-19 ARDS. There was one study published that was only six patients in the study, but only one of those patients survived in that study. When you look at the, the ELSO, uh, the data on all the ECMO being done right now on ARDS patients with COVID, the total number of percentage-wise of people surviving the ECMO who have COVID-19 ARDS is about 33% or so. So the only people who are gonna get ECMO are the people who are at an academic hospital where they can do ECMO. There's only about 250 hospitals in the United States who can do it. So these are gonna be at university hospitals. Uh, they're not gonna be, they're typically not at community hospitals. So most likely it's going to happen at a, at a university hospital, and that's who's going to be doing the ECMO most likely. So you have to be a candidate for ECMO, and it's certainly not a guarantee 
of survival. Um, Mike, there's a, a, a question since you mentioned about proning. Someone asked, does proning work for mild COVID? Does it help patients sick at home from developing more severe respiratory disease? I'll tell you what, there's no studies on it, but it can't hurt. It certainly can't hurt. So you might as well go for it. All right. So um, there's a question from South Old the Highway from YouTube. And uh, this person writes, where in South Florida does the outdoor UV light kill the virus? If so, how long does it take? Does wiping surfaces with hydrogen peroxide disinfect them? So um, I'll just tackle this uh, hydrogen peroxide question. The um, hydrogen peroxide is, so if you go on the EPA website, there's a list of, um, not really, I won't say approved, but I guess uh, a list of uh, disinfectants that the EPA has suggested. Now, there are a lot of other disinfectants that uh, are effective, but for some reason haven't made it onto the EPA list. It's about 100 different disinfectants, and hydrogen peroxide is one of those um, disinfectants they, they recommend. Now, there's a link, I think, on the video I did on... Um, the masks and disinfection. So I can always link to it on Mike's uh, YouTube channel and I'll link it to mine if you guys want to check out what those approved uh, disinfectants are. So according to the uh, International UV Association, there are actually three types of UV light, UVA and B, and that's the ones you need guys, uh, some of you guys that go to tanning salons and uh, tanning boots, um, that's the type of light that you're going to see, and, and that's mostly sunlight. There's some uh, evidence that sunlight might kill um, coronavirus, but again, nothing really. Uh, there's nothing really right now to suggest that's the case. The third type of UV light is called UVC. It's the most damaging UV light, um, and there were studies that were done from the first coronavirus, the SARS outbreak, which showed that it was actually effective. It's usually about 10 to 15 minutes of exposure for the UVC light um, could kill the first coronavirus. We're still trying to get data and evidence from this current infection, uh, but considering how the first SARS or the first coronavirus and this, uh, this coronavirus, there's a lot of similarities. Um, I, think there's some, um, I think there's some belief and confidence that it could work. So UVC light is about 200 to 280 nanometers, which is the germicidal range. Um, and again, like I said, this is the different than the tanning boots that some of you guys go to. I don't really need that. I have a natural tan, but uh, probably Mike, I don't know if you've got experience with going to tanning boots. But uh, So how the UVC light work is they shred the RNA and DNA of viruses. And currently there's a company um, that I found, uh, they are a Dutch company, they made a robot that can take 10 to 15 minutes to uh, disinfect the room. And they're being used right now in Chinese hospitals in Wuhan. And I believe in the United States, there are some trials that um, where they're looking into uh, having UVC robots cleaning American hospitals. So uh, that's um, so. It, hopefully, that answers your question about UV light. Yeah, and then a lot of people also ask. Someone was asking about spirometer. Uh, no, so I mean, in center spirometer, that's where you take deep breaths. It's not going to hurt. The, the thing of it is it doesn't really do anything to prevent infection except for if you have what we call atelectasis, which is where you have partial collapse of your lungs, where some parts of the lungs, especially in obese people, where the, the weight of the chest actually can compress small parts of the lung, especially at the bottom of the lungs here. So when that happens, when there's atelectasis, those areas of the lung are more prone to getting infections. It's usually it's bacterial infections. So it might help prevent it, uh, but it's hard to say that it's certainly, it's, it's hard to say it's gonna reduce your chances significantly, but it's really not gonna hurt. And so my recommendation to people in general would be, sure, go ahead and use a spirometer. It's not gonna hurt, but it's probably not gonna affect your chances all that much. Mike, I got a I got a question about 
Uh, what about steroids during cytokine storm? Can they quiet down immune system? So uh, this is from Lally Lazava. Uh, so Lally, uh, steroids are actually currently being investigated um, uh, to be, uh, to be a, a treatment option for cytokine storm. We don't know. Uh, there is some evidence for, uh, to suggest that steroids do play a role in um, sort of mitigating or yeah, calming down the immune system. But that is one of many medications they're looking at, steroids, antivirals, and the interleukin-6 inhibitors, tocilizumab, uh, the interleukin-1 inhibitor, and Akinra is another one, the JAK inhibitors. Uh, those are some of the ones they're looking at. So it's not, there's not going to be one magic drug that's going to sort of solve this problem. Steroids can also cause, I mean, there's, if you're on chronic steroids or taking it for, for even several days, there could be adrenal insufficiency. You could have um, uh, inability to form a stress response, um, respond to any stresses from your body. Uh, and also, it can also lower your uh, immune system, so making you more susceptible for COVID-19 or secondary bacterial infections or other viral infections. So Again, a lot more clinical trials and studies need to be done, and they are being conducted on, on steroids. Yeah, a lot of people are asking about when we will be opening or reopening the country. Will the virus go away in the summer or be reduced? The, honestly, the biggest thing that's going to affect the virus is us, is people. You realize the virus can't survive without us. The virus depends on survival by us transmitting it. That's the only way it can live. The re, you know, the, back in the 1918, the Spanish flu, that killed millions of people. The reason why it slowed down is because there's, no, there's hardly any people left to kill. But in terms of how we can improve the virus, that's really up to us. It's really a matter of doing what we're doing. If, if we actually let up doing what we're doing, it's going to go back up. Yes, the heat, the humidity, it can slow down maybe a little bit. It's not going to prevent it, though. It's not. It might reduce it a little bit, but it's not going to prevent the spread. We can prevent the spread. So the thing is, if we keep doing everything that we're doing, you're going to get lower and lower numbers. But the second you let off, it's going to come roaring right back. And it's, it's going to keep doing that cycle over and over unless we stay with it. That's the key. Now this is gonna. This is the way it's gonna be, unfortunately, for a while. At some point, you have to ask yourself, well, when do you take that risk of lives being lost versus getting back uh, with the rest of the world, getting back on track? Just like, hey, listen, influenza spreads, right, and that kills people, but we don't shut down the country because we have to accept some sort of risk. The question is, where do you accept that risk? The reason why we can't accept the risk right now is because that risk is too high with this virus. This virus spreads too easily and it kills too easily. That's the risk that's too big to take right now. So we need to keep things shut down for a while in order to minimize that risk, to bring down the numbers. And hopefully, hopefully it's a race against time, but hopefully we get some medication that we find in these clinical trials that works. That way we can avoid this. Also, the same thing with a vaccine, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. It's going to be at least a year before we have a vaccine available and everyone has to get the vaccine. Or the more people that get the vaccine, the better, the more herd immunity you'll get. You realize like for influenza, only half the people actually get the vaccination for influenza. So when it comes to a vaccination for COVID, I'll say when, not if, when we get that vaccination, probably a year, year and a half from now, people need to get that vaccination in order to reduce the spread of disease. But we're not there yet. That's a long ways away. The thing right now is we have to keep doing what we're doing. And hopefully we get a medicine, hopefully by summer, hopefully it's by then, hopefully we get a medicine that reduces the chances of getting infection, also reduces the severity of infection. But no one has a crystal ball right now. This is where we are right now. Hopefully, Hopefully, the numbers go down significantly in the summer, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of attack on that, too. Um, the, the one thing about influenza is that um, we have a vaccine. We actually have antivirals, um, like Tamiflu. It's been a 
it's been a lot of us have antibodies to certain strains of influenza. We've been exposed with this current COVID-19. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have medications. Um, we don't, you know, now only like a, a good percentage of the population is developing antibodies. I mentioned earlier about the website nextstrain.org. And when you look at the, uh, that website, you can see the whole, uh, you can track the virus, where it came from. The West Coast came directly from China, whereas most of the East Coast inf inf infections came from Europe and they got it from China. It's really fascinating. You guys should just go uh, take a look at this website. One of the things that's really interesting from the data that the next strain uh, is showing is that social distancing, uh, especially out in California, is working. Um, that because once we know the, the virus is not mutating fast, but to see the strains uh, and see the effects of social distancing and the effects that it has, um, it's pretty telling. The other thing too is, um, you know, years ago, I did a train trip around the country. I got on an Amtrak. I started in New York City. I ended up in, in Southern Texas. Um, and one of the things I realized having, you know, grew up in America was how big and vast the United States is. Um, many of the countries are not, first of all, as diverse and as big as America. And I know some of the things happening in, my, it might seem like that's a New York problem, that's a Los Angeles problem or a San Francisco problem. And in my little small town, it doesn't affect me. Why do I have to follow social distancing? The thing is, this virus doesn't care if you're a small town, large town, you're a Democrat or Republican, it's going to affect any human it comes into contact with. And you might be in an isolated part of the country or isolated part of the world. There's still a chance you could get it. The other thing that people have been saying is, well, you know, if you look at the numbers, um, even though someone in the media have been talking about younger patients getting it and there's an outbreak you know, or the, maybe the cytokine storms or, and this virus is mutating and all sorts of things I've read, the numbers still with young people are still low. Uh, compared to your older older people and people with underlying disease, but there still could be they're potentially asymptomatic carriers. So, for example, you might be a young thirty year old. You might get it. You may not know it, but you're passing that infection to your your parents, your grandparents, your loved ones. So, in my opinion, um, opening the country quickly and just saying, okay, we're going to have young people because they're not dying quickly or they're not dying from this from this infection or they're asymptomatic for example let them get get to work and then the elderly or people that are immunocompromised or underlying disease we can just lock them up i don't know how that works cuz they're going to be people are going to communicate people are going to interact with each other so you can't lock down certain people by due to their age or their demographics um, it's just not possible. So I think for now, we do need to, I understand the economic implications. I think all of us have been feeling it. Uh, even my physician friends, they've all gotten pay cuts. Some have lost their jobs. Me personally, I do contract anesthesia. I travel around the country. I've had all my anesthesia contracts canceled. The only jobs I'm doing are ICU jobs. So um, it's affecting all of us, and it's ter it it's absolutely sucks. It it affects. And like I said, I empathize with everyone, but we're starting to see in some countries that there might be the potential for reinfection. I think in South Korea they're talking about reinfection. Singapore uh, is having facing a second wave. They actually have more cases now than than they did before. They started to have deaths now. Initially there were no deaths reported in Singapore, and now all these other the people, their expats came back from Singapore, came back home to Singapore. Um, and they started to see deaths and starting to see increase in the numbers. And we obviously don't want that to happen. This COVID-19 is going to exist, in my opinion, for a long time. Um, it's, it's, we're never going to get down to zero. There's always going to be cases. But we don't want that second wave. We don't want it to happen when we don't have a, an effective uh, vaccine and we don't have any medication right now to treat it. So I think, as Dr. Hansen was saying, I think as long as, you know, once we get some... Um, more data and more understanding on some of these medications. Uh, possibly, um, I think that we might have a vaccine available by the summer. Uh, if you saw my vaccine video, I talk about some of the new experimental vaccines. That's not going to be for um, 
the, a mass campaign. I think they're really going to target high risk populations like healthcare workers. And as Dr. Hansen was saying, they're probably about at least 12 to 18 months before we see any sort of mass uh, vaccination um, in, in the United States and in the world. Yeah. And I, I think someone, and, and also just sort of to follow up with, um, I think there's, and, and this has been in the news a little bit, Mike, uh, about the influenza, or sorry, the, the COVID-19 uh, mortality rate uh, being lower uh, than um, than what had been initially reported. And, and I think this goes back to, Mike, what you were talking about earlier. Just overall with COVID-19, we're still, we're still getting data. We're still getting information. And one of the things is uh, with the WHO, sometime around February, uh, they reported, and I was reading this in the Lancet, that they're expecting the mortality rate to be roughly about 5.4 to 5.7%. And now we're starting to see models. Uh, we're actually in the pandemic itself, and we're seeing the models that we had before, which were models versus having real data are showing the mortality rate is actually much lower yeah even so you can see my they, videos that i've done back two months ago when this before this was officially called a pandemic based on the numbers that they were publishing in the studies that were done in china where one study had like seventy thousand people in it those numbers showed that the the mortality rate or the case fatality rate was around three percent or so maybe two percent but you have to keep in mind that the testing is going to lower that that number. So the true case fatality rate, the more people you test, the lower that's going to be. So it's estimated that the true case fatality rate is probably closer to 1% or so. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's probably somewhere around there. Now, some people are saying uh, 1%, that's very low. You really are going to develop a vaccine for only 1%. 1% of people in this country, will you do 1% times 350 million, how many people is that? 3.5 million? That's just this country, never mind the world. So to accept a death of you know 3.5 million people per year in this country, that's unacceptable. That's way too high. So even though 1% sounds low, it's actually way too high. Um. Mike, um, here's a there's a, a question. And it just sort of it's, it's probably a bunch of questions. I'm just going to summarize it. Um, it's in terms of the experimental drugs. Um, which ones, in our opinion, um, show the most promise? That's actually my next video, which should be up either tomorrow or Tuesday. But uh, I've gone over all of the video well all, not all of but most of the drugs that are in clinical trials as we speak and there are certain ones that i feel are stronger than others based on what we've seen in previous types of studies the ones that look the most promising are the ones that affect il6 the yes also the ones that affect the replication of the virus which is remdesivir that's one of them so the other one I feel strongly about, like I mentioned earlier, are the ARBs such as Losartan, Candesartan, et cetera. Um, so when I was mentioning IL-6 receptor antagonists, that includes things like tocilizumab, serolimumab as well. And I don't have much faith, based on what we know already, of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. And also, Kaletra, which is the HIV medication, that's not looking very promising either. But again, we won't know for sure until we get these clinical trials. I yeah no I'm I'm gonna I'll I'll sort of reiterate what you said. For me personally, I uh, have strongly felt uh, from the very get go that remdesivir uh, is going to show the most promise, and and that's because it's been around for about 15, 16 years. It's been studied for uh, from Ebola, wasn't found to be very effective, uh, but it did have some. Uh, effectiveness against SARS and MERS. So the researchers didn't have anything from scratch. Uh, they were not starting from scratch. Um, Tocilizumab, um, that's, you know, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I personally think that 
uh, the cyto the role of cytokines is probably key to the entire pathogenesis. Um, and, and with that being said, any of the cytokine blockers, specifically um, interleukin six, I think plays a major role. And again, Mike, I, I agree with you. I'm 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 coming up probably tomorrow um, afternoon. I'm just finishing up a video on uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, you know, I hate to sound like I'm tearing it apart, but I guess maybe in this video, I am going to tear it apart. Um, just looking at the data, um, published data, and also anecdotally speaking, speaking to uh, other physician friends of mine, um, and also seeing friends of mine that are, are sick with COVID-19 and are in ICUs and are not responding to the hydro hydroxychloroquine azithromycin combo, um, makes me think that uh, we might have jumped the gun too soon on that medication. A lot of people but are also asking about... Are, with that being said, yeah. I, I was just going to say, with that being said, there are 104 clinical trials right now, um, and I'll, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more tomorrow. Um, there are 104 clinical trials right now looking into hydroxychloroquine. So um, my point, I think, Mike, you'll probably agree with me, we're not saying it is not effective. It's just saying we don't have any data right now to suggest that it is effective. And we personally feel like there is, there might be other medications that might be better. People are also asking about ivermectin in uh, giving plasma the antibodies from recovered patients. So ivermectin, I couldn't find any uh, clinical trials that ivermectin is enrolled. There was a study done in vitro looking at ivermectin and it had lots of suppression of the virus. Basically, it reduced the amount of virus in the cell by 50,000 times within a 48 hour time span. But this was in a test tube in the lab, so not in clinical trials. So that's why I don't have, I don't really have a lot of promise for that drug as of right now. I'm not saying it can't be effective or it won't be. Just as of right now, it's not in a clinical trial, so it's not going to be available anytime soon, at least legally. Then there's uh, people asking about IVIG plasma from recovered patients. So the idea with this is that people who recover from the virus, they make antibodies, IgG antibodies and IgM antibodies that attack the virus. So that way the next time if they were to get the virus, their immune system attacks that virus and prevents it from causing infection. So the idea is when you take that person's blood and you collect it and then you spin that down in the centrifuge, and you take only parts of that blood, not all the blood, you take the parts of the blood that have the antibodies, that's what we call the plasma, then we save that plasma, then we give it to someone else who has infection. So all that, you know, that's shown promise and there's, there's great results so far, but again, hasn't been in clinical trials as of right now. There's just a few issues with doing that. One is, it, is, it does carry some risk because when you do that, you have these things called transfusion reactions, allergic reactions can happen to that plasma. The other thing is, if you think about the numbers, the number of people having infections, you need to have a lot of people donating blood in order to get enough plasma to give to other people. So that's going to tell lots of blood donations in order to get that to other people. So the rate limiting step there is gonna be the number of people that can donate blood. So that's not gonna be the medicine that you can give to everyone. That's why that's a significant downside. But it's been used for other diseases before and it does, it has been shown to work for other diseases and so far has shown that it works in some patients and it's not in clinical trials yet so we can't say that for sure but um, it does seem or would appear to be effective and it's going to be limited though in terms of who you can do that with. Yeah, Mike, and, and so that's a, that's a concept called convalescent plasma. It was used in, you know, polio, measles, mumps. So it's, it's been used, I think, since the beginning of the, the 20th century. Um, the thing with convalescent plasma or the antibodies is a lot of times you when you when you take it from someone that's recovered the antibodies and you give it to an infected person it creates almost like a passive immunity uh which can minimize some of the severity of the of the symptoms but you still need to develop your own antibodies to to fight off that infection and as mike said it's a you're you're looking at quantity of these antibodies and not every infection 
of convalescent uh, plasma is actually going to work. Like I said, it worked for polio, measles, I, I believe for influenza too. But there are other viral infections it didn't work for. You know, people are asking about hyperbaric, to be done. Hyperbaric, ox, uh, hyperbaric oxygen. So there's also lots of questions with that. In, and that hasn't been tested for COVID ARDS. But the reason why it's not tested is it's not thought that it would be effective because that's not how we get oxygen into our bloodstream. Lots of times it's used to treat for, let's say, uh, infections that have, for gangrene where you isolate a body part and then you put it there and it gets the, the oxygen locally at least a little bit. But the problem with getting oxygen into the bloodstream is it has to go through the lungs unless you're doing ECMO. That's the only way you're going to get oxygen into the lungs. So to give it for ARDS, it's, it's just not going to work, unfortunately. And also you know, there's the other I'll aspect of the, uh... the also the logistics of, even if it did work, the logistics of, Doing that would be hard. I'll let you talk about that, Ron. Yeah, no, yeah, I was, I was, you, you sort of read my mind. Um, the thing with with the hyperbaric oxygen, you know, I think there there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of centers that are that are running hyperbaric chambers. The thing is, most most hospitals don't have a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, it is not a machine you can roll out. I know there are some things online you're reading about. People have some sort of helmets, but it, realistically. Hyperbaric chambers are not in an ICU. When you have a sick patient in the ICU, a lot of times they're going to be intubated. Um, you have one of the things anyone in, in medicine or hospital is going to tell you, the worst thing you could do to a patient is, is transport them. And the scariest time um, is when you're transporting them. I've had patients uh, in my career, in my experience, that have coded during transport. They're going to CAT scan or MRI. So you want to minimize any movement or transport of patients. Number two, we're concerned about infection with, um, well, you know, if they're intubated and then they're going exposing themselves in this hyperbaric chamber, could you aerosolize all of these, uh, these viral particles? Um, and, and, and three, as I mentioned earlier, it's the availability of these uh, hyperbaric chambers. A lot of hospitals, most hospitals don't have it. Uh, I don't know if your hospital has it, Mike. I haven't. No, it's... The last time I, I saw one was when I worked in when I worked in New York, but that was the last time I even was around a hyperbaric chamber it was like 15, 50 miles of me. So, Yeah, and people are asking about hyperbaric being used for the bends. So that has to do with partial pressure of nitrogen in the blood and partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. But that's not going to be the same physiology. It's not the same physiology with ARDS. Uh, so it's the hyperbaric it wouldn't have that same applicable treatment with COVID-19 ARDS. I mean, you, it could, I think there are some studies that I, I think so in, in when the Spanish uh, flu, you know, Mike and I, we, Mike, we, we were talking about this the other day. So in the 1918 Spanish flu, uh, there is one physician that observed that patients, uh, people that had got Spanish flu, in Colorado, Utah, in high altitude, tend to have uh, more severity of the infection. There are higher rates of, of the Spanish flu. And what they, what they did was they, they theorized it was the high pressure, or, I'm sorry, the low pressure and the low oxygen of, um, in, in the high altitude was the reason why. So they put some of these patients in these, I guess, I would call it high, some sort of chamber, some pressurized chamber, and they saw improvement. And uh, there's always been a theory that hyperbaric, and, and that's the reason why they started looking into hyperbaric uh, therapy or hyperbaric chamber. But um, again, it's it it could work, but is it something we want to do in the middle of a pandemic when we still don't even understand this disease? I don't know. Someone might want to run a clinical trial, but I don't want to be around the transport of that patient. Yeah, and then someone was asking about Advair. So Advair is a medication inhaler type where you you puff it in and it actually contains two medications, uh, fluticasone and salmeterol. And one of these medications acts by stimulating the beta-2 receptor. It's an agonist of the beta-2 receptor and it acts to dilate the bronchial tube. So it dilates your airways by relaxing the smooth muscle that's there. And then the other drug is the inhaled steroid. And that and what that does is it reduces the amount of inflammation within your lungs. And that's what happens with asthma. There's inflammation within the lungs. So someone was asking if they're on 
Advair, are they more susceptible to getting the virus? And I would say if the Advair is controlling the asthma, then the, the chances of getting the virus would be less or the chances of having severe disease would be less, although there aren't studies to back up what I'm saying. This is based on my expertise, on my opinion, what I know about asthma and what I know about viral infections and bacterial infections getting into the lungs. The downside to Advair is because it has the inhaled steroid in it, it does make some people more prone to getting thrush, which is caused by fungus, candidiasis. That's usually in the throat, back of the tongue. But in terms of uh, you know making someone more prone to getting virus deep into their lungs, the answer is no. It's going to be it's going to be the control of the asthma that's the most important. If the if the asthma is out of control, then scarier things can happen if the asthma is out of control. So the most important thing is getting the asthma under control. Mike, I'm, uh, I got a question earlier um, about, um, so let, let me know what your hospital is doing right now in this. It's sort of the availability of some of these um, um, sort of experimental drugs. I, I, most of the hospitals that I'm aware of, um, most of my colleagues are uh, using hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin. Now, remdesivir um, is only available at certain hospitals. Now, Gilead, Gilead Sciences, I, I'm going to butcher the name of the pharmaceutical, uh, they released, I think, about 1.5 million doses of the of remdesivir. It comes in an intravenous format, so it's not like a, a, a physician can write you a script for it. Uh, so, because it's formulated as an intravenous, uh, intravenously, obviously you have to be inpatient. Now, um, they're giving it on a trial, if, if, uh, if your physician is doing a clinical trial or on a trial basis. I know that Mount Sinai, I was just looking at their protocols, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, uh, if, if uh, their physicians wanted to administer remdesivir, and it's only, I'm on the website right now, um, they're, they actually, even if they have a mild disease, they're considering remdesivir. Um, and, even, you know, it's for everyone with, uh, with COVID-19, even with mild, mild symptoms. But they have to sign up for a clinical trial. Um, some of the other drugs, none of my physician friends have, and, and even myself, have sort of, I, I've talked to anyone personally. I don't know about you, Mike. Like, what have you seen in terms of these experimental drugs? Well, as far as uh, hydroxychloroquine, I know that... There's a lot of people, whether that be nurses from other hospitals that I've worked at that I still uh, remain in contact with, that or when they're interviewing doctors at SUNY Downstate in the news, they asked one of the doctors there who was involved in a clinical trial, they asked him, well, what are you seeing for results? And he said, not good. There's other doctors on social media who are pulmonary critical care doctors saying they're involved in their uh, clinical trial at their hospital. They're not seeing good results. So again, these are all stories and this is, I believe the people that are saying this. Also, there's other studies that maybe not have been clinical trials, but have been studies nonetheless that didn't look good as well, like the one in Brazil. That's why I have such low confidence in hydroxychloroquine as, as, a, as a drug for COVID. But again, we need to see the randomized clinical trials to know for sure. And then someone's think, asking uh, about, like, I, I you know, combi combining different drugs like hydroxychloroquine plus remdesivir. Yeah, that's the thing is it's possible that we could use different combinations of drugs. The only thing is you have to make sure that it's not only does it work, but it's also safe to use. So it's definitely a possibility, and we won't know until we see the results. Yeah, you also have to be careful with, you know, a question we get a lot is using supplements and nutrients. Um, some of the over-the-counter drugs. Uh, people ask me, should they take it? And I think, Mike, you're, you're probably the same boat as me. We're not going to give anyone medical advice um, because we don't have all the information. And some of these medications actually can harm allopathic medications that you're taking, increase, um, you know, can increase bleeding, for example, or cause more sedation. So we, we're very cautious about recommending anyone taking supplements without first talking to your physician, someone that knows your overall health. Absolutely. Mike, I, I've got a couple of questions about um, cardiac 
uh, cardiac risk? Uh, have I seen any patients with inherited cardiomyopathies? Um, no, I, I haven't seen anyone. When you're saying inherited cardiomyopathies, I'm, I'm wondering if there, if you mean any sort of underlying um, arrhythmias, or I'm not sure what the question is. But in terms of cardiomyopathies, you know, they can be induced several ways: viral, um, chemical, or sort of two things that just come to uh, top of my mind right now. Um, and and I, I believe that anyone with an underlying condition, especially cardiac or respiratory, um, is going to have a high uh, risk of developing severe uh, symptoms of COVID-19. So, and, and you tend to see these conditions more in the elderly, in the immunocompromised. And that's why we, we're really much more cautious um, with this population, which goes back to our discussion about reopening the country, because these are the people we are going to be really, really closely watching um, and having to make sure that um, a second wave or reinfection doesn't occur. Yeah, also uh, a few things. So someone's asking about Massey had a question. She has lung disease. I'll answer the best that I can. Can you repeat the question? And then people are asking about type O blood. And then someone is saying hydroxychloroquine without zinc is pointless. Well, it could very well be. Again, we don't know because we don't have the clinical trials. But hydroxychloroquine is actually now in a clinical trial with zinc. So I hope we get those results soon, and I hope it's positive. We'll see. Uh, so, Mike, can I can I just uh, just interrupt you real yeah, quick? Yeah, go ahead. Just sort of, I, I just wanted to point something. Out. Just going back to my my diagram over here. So it is believed that hydroxychloroquine blocks the the, the spike protein, the ACE2 receptor. The other mechanism that hydroxychloroquine works is that sometimes the virus will form an endosome, um, and it basically will take this virus over here, will take a piece of the skin, uh, not skin, sorry, the, 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 the cell lining, and sort of wrap itself around. It's almost like a, uh, it's wrapping itself around a blanket. And it gets inside, and it forms what's called an endosome. And that endosome is actually acidic in nature, and hydroxychloroquine is, is believed to increase the pH of the viral endosome, which is that, that viral, the virus, the mRNA inside the virus, and basically rendering it inactive. And that's another mechanism of how hydroxychloroquine works. And as I mentioned earlier, zinc is believed to inhibit the replicase enzyme, and it, again, is believed to get in because by hydroxychloroquine opening up, uh, so almost like a channel for the zinc to get in. But here's something to think about. Hydro is it hydroxychloroquine that's working? Is it zinc that is working? And the other thing with azithromycin is some people have been suggesting it's because of a secondary back bacterial infection is trying to prevent that. Uh, azithromax, um, is actually an interleukin-6 inhibitor. So there's a lot of studies that have come out saying that. So when you're combining all three of them, it's for me personally, it's giving a little bit of a muddy picture because we're not sure which drug is having an effect. Is are all three of them, or is it just one of them or two of them? And this is why you know this is why we do those clinical studies, those randomized studies to get that data to see exactly what drug is working for whom and why. What are the side effects? What's the drug dose? When to treat it? These are all questions we don't have right now. Yep. And I think was Massey's question about uh, fibrocystic disease? Yes. Okay. So, sorry. Fibrocystic disease. I can't speak on your case individually, Maggie, but generally speaking, people with lung disease are more prone to having worse disease when they have a pneumonia, whether that's a viral pneumonia or a bacterial pneumonia. Just like people with cystic fibrosis, their airways have not only cysts, but also what we call bronchiectasis. And bronchiectasis is irreversible dilation of the big bronchi in the lungs. And they get lots of mucus buildup there. And they end up having to cough up tons and tons of phlegm. And lots of bacteria stay there because they have such a hard time removing that bacteria from their lungs. And that's why they get lots of bacterial infections. 
So when it comes to increased risk for viral infections or increased risk of having worse disease from viral infections, generally speaking, yes. But again, I don't want to comment specifically to your case um, because I'm not your doctor. I'm not your pulmonologist. So I don't think it'd be right for me to give you individual advice. Mike, I got a, I got a question about HOCAM, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, yeah. uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy, uh, if these could... Uh, sort of heart damage, I guess maybe increase the uh, FEC. I think that's the sort of my understanding is could any sort of um, um, heart damage or anything like that, or like Holcomb, cause any cause worsening of the COVID nineteen. So again, that that goes to my uh, my my comment earlier about anyone with any underlying disease has an increased risk of severity. Uh, of, of developing severe COVID-19 infections. Now, specific, specifically with Holcomb, uh, you have a left ventricular outflow obstruction. What that means is um, if you have low volume of blood, the, um, you're going to have an obstruction. So that's why you see Holcomb, um, you see the sudden death in athletes, because what happens is, especially football players, they're out, it's hot, it's a sunny day. They've been working out. They're sweating. They've lost half of their their volume of fluid through by sweating. They haven't hydrated themselves. What happens is uh, the pathology is basically a, a, a low intravascular uh, volume uh, causes the heart to basically collapse. Um, and with COVID-19, one of the risks behind it is developing a sepsis, um, whether that's due from the virus or the cytokine storm or the immune response. Um, and, and what sepsis does, it, it lowers the intravascular volume is you have a lot of third spacing where that fluid is going out into the, intravas into the, interstitial, into the interstitial space and not in the, in the vessels. And what happens, you start to see a decrease in the blood pressure. And also you have the immune response that's having a big effect on, uh, on sort of the permeability of the blood vessel. So by decreasing the fluid, you're decreasing the, the blood flow to the heart, you're worsening the hokum. So that's just, uh, I mean, is that happening? I mean, that's one possibility, but I'm just trying to illustrate how um, any sort of cardiac defects can, uh, it, it, any sort, and, and with COVID-19 infection can increase the severity of it. Yeah, a lot of people are asking about type O and blood types and how that impacts uh, chances of getting the virus or severity of illness. So you have to realize when you see these studies being done where they observe called observational studies and they see, oh, well, this patient had, these patients had less infection rates compared to these patients, or uh, they had less severe disease compared to these, these patients, whatever that is that they're looking at, whether it's typo or something else, such as age or morbid obesity or diabetes or whatever, you have to realize that a lot of these diseases go together. And this, this is what we call confounders. So just because something might be associated with something doesn't necessarily mean that there's uh, a cause. So association is not the same thing as causation. So let's say type O, whether it's good or bad, in terms of having an association or not having an association, that just might be a co-founder, it might be an association, and not necessarily mean that people with type O do better or do worse than people who are not type O. For me, from my perspective, I don't see why having a certain blood type would impact the risk of getting the, the risk of getting disease or impact the amount of severity of the disease because in all my research and all the studies that I've looked at I have no reason to believe that the virus would be affected by that in any way or the immune system would be infected affected by that in any way I can tell you that red blood cells they do not have ACE2 receptors on them so the virus is not able to bind to an ACE2 receptor on a red blood cell therefore it can't get in the red blood cell. Viruses aren't able to replicate inside red blood cells because red blood cells don't have the ribosomes necessary, all the cell machinery. They don't have that compared to other cells in the body in order for the virus to replicate. So how the type O, if it does have an association, if there is a relation at all, I'm not sure how it would either worsen or um, lessen the severity of illness or the chances of getting the illness. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll sort of add to that because I, I just did a video on, on potentially hemoglobin or the theory behind hemoglobin um, being part of the pathogenesis and sort of basing on that 
sort of computer model study from from China. Again, going back to just, I just want to quickly touch upon this. Um, I believe that cytokines are playing a role in uh, the the hematology and sort of the blood, um, possibly the the hemolysis taking place. So, I mean, like I said earlier, I think it's connecting. It's I think when it's all said and done, it might potentially connect the dots. I could be wrong, but um, I feel like there's just we're really scratching the tip of the iceberg. Too much bleach. Um, and... Mike, I just got it. Oh yeah, go ahead. Oh no, I just got it's. Uh, I got a lung question. Um, you're the expert in lungs. Uh, someone just asked a lung lavage. Can it help patients with severe COVID-19 infection? It doesn't make sense to me why it would. So when we do a lung lavage, whether that's through someone's endotracheal tube, meaning the breathing tube, we can do a lavage that way. Or sometimes we do what we call a bronchoalveolar lavage. That's when we do a bronchoscopy, meaning we go in with a tube and it has a camera and a light at the tip. And then we go all the way down inside the mouth, down inside the windpipe, the trachea, and then down inside the lungs. And then sometimes we squirt fluid into the very ends of those branches of the lungs and we can squirt the fluid there and we can suck it back up. That's what's called a lavage or a wash. That, if anything, when we do that, a little bit of fluid or a little bit more fluid ends up getting into the lungs when we do that because we can't suck up all that fluid that we just put into the lungs. So if anything, it would make the lungs worse. They'd have actually more fluid from doing that. So lavage would not be of any benefit. Sometimes we do put medicines down into the lungs and, and that's something different. But when we put medicines into the lungs, that's when we do nebulized. So sort of like an inhaler, but it's a nebulizer is where it's humidified air. And sometimes there's a medication that humidified air. And then when someone inhales it, it gets all the way down into the very tips of their lungs, into their alveoli. And that has benefits for, for some some medications have some benefits for some diseases when we do that. But uh, just a pure lavage by itself for ARDS from COVID-19, if anything, it'll just make the oxygenation worse. Mike, I, I got in a question earlier about um, a, a, a medication called oranofin. Um, and oranofin has been a little bit in the news lately. So oranofin is a, it's called a DMARD. It's a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. And, and so in some preliminary studies, they, in this lab, they infected human cells um, with the virus and they treated it with oranofin. And some of the data suggested that within, I think, two days, two or three days, uh, the amount of virus within the cells dropped by 90 or 95 percent, somewhere around that. So it looked like, uh, and they suggested that uh, the inflammation associated with coronavirus was also uh, dramatically reduced. Uh, some researchers believe that oranofins could have a reduction also in the expression of cytokines um, and also the cytokine storm. But again, like most of the medications we're talking about, we need more clinical trials. So it could potentially be um, a, a medication. In my opinion, I don't think this is going to be the sort of primary medication um, that's sort of going to cure or treat COVID-19 and or potentially the cytokine storms, but I think it could play a role as a, a secondary medication or an additional medication to help. Yeah, there. Uh, someone was asking about autoimmune disease and is that akin to a hyperactive or overactive immune system? In a way, yes, autoimmune disease is when your body's own immune system attacks part of your own body. And there's tons of different autoimmune diseases the immune system is so complex it's incredibly complex and so that's why it's so hard to make broad statements about oh well will steroids work don't know because steroids actually work for some things but don't work for other things they work for some infections to reduce the inflammation from some infections while they make some infections worse so the immune system is such an incredibly complex part of our body that it's, you really can't make broad statements. That's why when we're able to figure out a specific pathway that's causing a specific disease, and then we can take out that part of the immune system that's causing the damage, such as with these monoclonal antibodies that attack a specific part of the immune system that we know is causing the damage, that's what's ideal. So we wanna 
it's kind of like a bullet as, a, as opposed to a bazooka. You want to get a bullet to take out exactly the problem, not have all that collateral damage. And so I got a, I got a question, Mike. Um, have you heard about old techniques such as hydrotherapy to change body temperature to accelerate innate immune response early in infection or immune boost theories like sun forest bathing? Medcram guy has been talking about more traditional therapies, some of which were used in 1918 flu sanitariums. Um, again, I, I don't really know. Uh, I mean, it could work. Uh, I would say sun forest bathing uh, maybe it has something to do with vitamin D, getting some sun exposure. And if you're vitamin D deficient, it might play a role in boosting your immune system. But in terms of hydrotherapy, um, again, it could, but I don't, I don't, I haven't seen any data or anything really substantial um, to recommend that. Yeah, I mean, would it so, hurt? I don't, I don't see why not. But yeah, I mean, how, how do you have you have you come across anything like that, Mike? I haven't personally. It's, the, when when you look at when you look at things like these, they're so hard to study because there's so many confounding variables that could affect what you're looking for. So when you take something like, well, if I go camping or whatever, I go in the forest or whatever, you have to get so many people, so many numbers in that study to look at and then compare A to B, group A to B, and eliminate as many co confounders as possible. And still, even if you do all those things perfectly, you're not going to be able to eliminate all of them. That's why these, these studies that are done on drinking coffee or uh, one vitamin that's why they're so hard to get concrete answers on because there's so many confounders to get down to the bottom of what you're looking for. So that's why it's hard to get answers on these things. Now, there is a good... Mike, can I, yeah, can go I, ahead. Make, go ahead. Can I make a quick point yeah. uh, just to follow up on what you said? And this is why uh, when the hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin study came from France, from the, from the controversial French researcher uh, Raoul or DDA Raoul, I think his name was, the studies, he, he does not believe in controls in his studies. So right off the bat, it's very hard to, uh, as, a, as a physician, scientist, researcher, to uh, really make any sort of scientific decisions, scientific or medical clinical decisions based on his studies. You need controls in order to be able to study that. And it kind of goes to what, what you were saying. I might have a study and I might study 10 people, but is that those 10 people, uh, that small sample size, is that um, are they representative of the larger population? And one of the things we learn in biostatistics in medical school, uh, in residency, in our training, is that there's a concept called power. So power is the more number of people you have in a study, the more statistically uh, significant the data is going to be. It's more accurate because it's going to be more representative of the greater population. And that's why when you guys are reading studies or someone is talking about something, um, Go see how many people they're studying in that in in the sample size. That first study that came from France that everyone jumped and said hydroxychloroquine and, and azithromycin work. They only looked at 26 patients and six of them dropped out, and only 20 of them remained. So we're taking the results from 20 people and making inferences and decisions for the rest of the world. Uh, that was a follow-up study that was done that looked at 80 people. So now we're making decisions based on a total of 100 people. We're making a decision for 6 billion people or 7 billion people in the world. Um, you know, and this is why you want to have more studies, more data, more people. So one of the things you guys really want to look into is are these randomized, double-blinded control studies, how many people are involved in the study? Because one of the things is there's something called researcher bias. And when you, when, what double-blinded means is the researcher and the subject being tested are blinded. Because sometimes if I'm researching something, my own biases can come into play. If I'm trying to look for a, like a, a, a certain medication treating a sick people, I might want to put sick people in the medication group and put healthy people in the non-medication group. And you see, if you, hopefully you guys understand, when you start throwing in biases and you're not accounting for some confounders, then the data you're going to get 
um, is going to be skewed. And very, you know, and any clinical decisions that we make uh, can actually be detrimental to the greater population. Now, one someone was asking about the disparity in sexes. So why do women seem to either get it less frequently or get less severe disease if they do get it? Great question. We don't know the answer. I can speculate. What we do know is that IL-6 in play IL-6 plays a very important role in the cause of ARDS, especially with COVID-19. IL-6 is a huge initiator of the cytokine storm. It's part of the initiation of the cytokine storm from once that virus gets into the type 2 alveolar cell of the alveolus. Once that virus gets into that cell, it triggers these chemicals to be released, what we call cytokines. That's part of it. And one of the biggest cytokines that plays a factor is called IL-6, interleukin-6. So in previous studies, before COVID came out, it's been shown that estrogen actually suppresses IL-6. And how much does it do that? We don't know. We just know that it has been shown to suppress, the estrogen has been shown to suppress the activity of IL-6. So is it possible or is it plausible that women who have much higher amounts of estrogen in their blood compared to men, is that the reason why they are having less severe disease? Could be. It'd be nice to see studies looking into this, but we don't have those right now. But that's my best guess as to what's going on. And that's not to say that women can't get severe disease, women can't die. It has happened from COVID-19. So, um, But yes, the numbers do show that women have less frequency of ARDS with COVID-19, less amount of deaths. Hi, doctors. How do you see why some patients just drop dead literally while they are strong enough doing something? How does the virus cause this drastic effect? Uh, that's actually a pretty good question. Um, I, you know, again, we're still trying to understand the disease. I know you guys are going to get sick of hearing that phrase over and over again. But one of the uh, theories is that cytokines, as Dr. Hansen was just um, mentioning about, cytokines playing uh, a, a very prominent role. Uh, and in fact, many physicians believe that cytokines are the reason why many young people are succumbing to the disease. Because it's not just only affecting the lungs, you're having multi organ failure, um, heart, um, the liver, the kidneys. And, and personally, in my opinion, uh, from what I've seen in, in working in the ICU, um, is that whenever you have the liver and the kidneys being affected, uh, your mortality rates tend to increase uh, because these are central uh, organs for not only um, secreting and uh, detoxifying and excreting, but your liver, for example, makes uh, compounds or proteins, molecules, whatever you want to call it, for clotting factors. Uh, for synthesizing hemoglobin. Your kidneys are synthesizing. Um, they're making EPO for red blood cell production. They're regulating homeostasis. Uh, they're secreting all these enzymes. So you're not only affecting how the body is um, regulating uh, excretion uh, and detoxifying uh, chemicals and part of metabolism, you're really affecting the whole uh, homeostasis of the body. And I, I, feel, I personally feel when the liver and the kidneys take a hit, um, really, it, it, the patients re tend to have really poor outcome. And we're seeing a lot of young patients succumbing to it because, um, you know, from what I've read and from just talking with friends of mine, it's usually a multi-organ failure. Again, the respiratory system is central to all of it. So I'm not trying to minimize or say it's not involved. Uh, but I think it's it's all of these um, all of these organs, the multi-organ failures, is playing a major role in a lot of the younger patients succumbing. Mike, what are what are your what what are you seeing in the ICU and from what you've read regarding that? No, actually, it's been, I was, it's been a concern yeah. about younger people younger people succumbing to the to the infection and the sort of I think it's made people much more scared, even though the numbers are not as high as let's say the media or what the news is reporting. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it definitely happens. There's younger people who can die from this. It's just less likely. The, again, the people who are most prone to getting severe illness are elderly, um, those with underlying medical problems. There is a big association between having high blood pressure and uh, the risk of severity of disease. 
So that's definitely part of it. But we don't know exactly why people, some people get worse disease than others, uh, other than we just know these associations that are taking place, why relatively few kids are getting very sick from it. It does happen, just the numbers are so low. I think there's different reasons that are being considered, uh, such as what I talked about in my last video, such as the amount of virus you get into your body. Okay, lots of these healthcare workers, there's, there's a study showing that it does look like the viral load, meaning how much virus you get into your body is playing a part. Another factor is the location of your ACE2 receptors. We have them in our nose, we have them in our mouth, we have them in our throat, we have them at the bottom of our lungs and our alveoli. So let's just say you get the, the virus in these ACE2 receptors in your nose, maybe it just stays there and maybe it doesn't travel down to your lungs. Or maybe in some people it is traveling down to the lungs. Maybe they have silent aspiration. We all have some silent aspiration when we sleep. Is that how you know it's getting down into the lungs without necessarily inhaling it all the way down into your lungs? So viral load, uh, location of ACE2 receptors playing a part. Um, I mentioned estrogen and IL-6, that might be playing a part. Risk factors, age, body's immune system, there's, you know, which drugs you're already taking, is that playing a part? If you're on certain drugs, does that mean you're less likely or more likely to get it? Probably. So when you look at all these factors, that's what you have to look at. There's also different uh, phenotypes of the parts of the immune system uh, that's playing a role in all this, such as the ACE enzyme, there's variations of that. So there's so many different variations. It probably comes down to genetics. Sex is probably playing a role. The amount of virus you get into your system is playing a role. Do you get the virus just in your nose and it stays there? Or do you inhale it all the way in? Or do you get it here and then you silently aspirate it down? All these different factors are likely playing a role in terms of why some people have more severe disease than others. But again, that's all just what we're looking at. We don't have concrete evidence to say this is exactly why some people have worse, worse disease than others. Mike, it's, uh, we've been writing for two and a half hours. Oh, wow. Now. Time flies when having fun. Yeah. Um, how about we, uh, we do this next week? Guys, you want us to do this next week, if next Sunday night? Yeah, you guys, what do you guys think? Do a uh, question and answer again next uh, next Sunday night? Can read help? What, what did they say? Can read help? We talked about that earlier. Oh. Um, so I know this week, uh, Dr. Hansen and I, we've got uh, a bunch of other videos coming in. Um, y you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things I'll, I'll just say that we didn't make, start making YouTube videos because of coronavirus. Mike and I, we, we probably talked about this over a year ago, how there was a lot of um, misinformation, a lot of uh, everyone wanting to be a social media star and write all these concoctions and things that were not based on science and evidence. And, you know, Mike and I, we, we, we talked extensively about, um, you know, how we w wanted to bring evidence-based medicine. We're not here to uh, come up with uh, treatments or give you guys home remedies or quick fixes, but just to give you the real science and the data. And we figured both of us would uh, be able to tackle things take things from different approaches. So I know Mike's got a couple of really interesting videos coming up this week. I've got a couple of videos this week about uh, COVID-19. And uh, so hopefully guys, you know, have any questions, send them our way. Both of us tied up with our clinical practice, but, um, you know, we'll try to find some time. And then next Sunday, we'll just all come together and, you know, try to um, try to answer some of the questions. As I mentioned earlier, when there's a lack of information, um, there is panic. And panic creates fear. Fear creates um, people giving false information, and then things start spreading, and uh, just chaos breaks down. And what we're trying to do is just say, 
Um, there's research, there's things happening. It may not be as fast as we want. We may not have the answers we all we, we want to hear, but things are trending in a positive direction. I know right now it doesn't seem that way. When you turn on the news, you're hearing all these infections. Infection rates are coming down. Um, you cannot look at cumulative infections because like say for example there were 50 infections today and let's say there's 25 tomorrow and then it's reported oh there's 75 COVID-19 infections in this rate you have to look at rates and and now the country with social distancing uh, with people taking this infection very seriously unfortunately there's also a big chunk of people that are not my home state of Florida and all those people in the beaches in Jacksonville please stay home um, but um, we, you know, there are measures in place. We're trending in the right direction. We still are a long ways from getting to where we were before this outbreak. But let's all stay in this together. If you guys have any questions, uh, send them to Dr. Hansen or myself, and we'll try to get you the appropriate information. If we don't know something, we don't have the information, we're going to say we don't know. There are no studies right now. Yes. Thanks, Beeb Sorelli. Thanks for all your positive comments to everyone. Uh, glad you showed up. Glad you want to get to the truth of things. Again, we don't have all the answers. There's still that we need to learn about COVID-19. We're trying our best to keep up with all the studies that are taking place. And uh, this is what we do in our free time when we're not at work. And we will be bringing more videos. I will. I know you will too. Uh, but I have one coming either tomorrow, most likely tomorrow, but if not, for sure, Tuesday. And uh, we'll go from there. So, again, thanks, guys. And we will do this again next week, next Sunday night. And send your questions our way. Ram, Dr. Yo, what's your Instagram? Uh, well, real quick, guys. Uh, this is my concoction. Remember, this drink with my cinnamon and my, my taco seasoning mix. And remember, to send this viral, $9.99, you can PayPal me. I might as well jump in with the other quacks on on social media. Um, my Instagram, guys, is um, I'm at ECA. Um, here's my logo. That's the name of my uh, my practice. Uh, and ECA Wellness on Instagram. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube. My channel is Dr. Yo. Um, and Mike's, I, I think, do you, do you remember your Instagram? Yeah, channel? it's uh, at Dr. Dot Hansen. I'll put it, I'm typing it in right now so everyone can see it. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks again. Uh, look forward to okay. your comments on my uh, videos. I'll try to get to them if I can. I can't always get to all of them. And I look forward to uh, answering more questions next Sunday night as well. So good night. Take care. Be safe. Sounds good. Have a good night. Thank you, guys.